can everyone take their seats? I'd like to call this meeting to order. Thank you for your cooperation. Okay, call the meeting to order. I'll Roll call. Order. Commissioner Lama. Here. Commissioner Rabinovich. Here. Commissioner Stuvesan. Here. Vice Mayor Riscara. Here. Mayor Goldman. Here. All members present. Um, Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like Maggie Gordo to uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Our invocation, uh, Father Flanagan. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Mayor and all the city officials and everybody here. Let us pray. Dear wise and loving Father, first let us say thank you on behalf of all who are gathered here today. Thank you for your many and abundant blessings. Thank you for life itself for the measure of health, we need to fulfill our callings for sustenance and for friendship. Thank you for the ability to be involved in useful work and for the honor of bearing appropriate responsibilities. Thanks as well for the freedom to embrace you or the freedom to reject you. Thank you for loving us even from your boundless and gracious nature. In the scriptures you have said that citizens ought to obey the governing authorities since you have established those very authorities to promote peace and order and justice. Therefore, I pray for our mayor, Donna Goldman, for the various levels of city officials and in particular for this assembled council. We ask that you would graciously grant them wisdom to govern amid the conflicting interests and issues of our times, a sense of the welfare and true needs of our people, a keen thirst for justice and righteousness, confidence in what is good and fitting, and the ability to work together in harmony even when there is honest disagreement peace in their lives and joy in their task. Let us pray for the agenda set before them today. Please give them an assurance of what would please you and what would benefit those who live and work in and around our beloved city of Sunny Isles Beach. It is in your most blessed name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening. Now for our opening statement. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for being here tonight. Please turn off or mute any electronic devices to avoid interrupting these proceedings. In all issues that may become before the City Commission, we ask that everyone show mutual respect for one another by listening quietly to each person speaking and that everyone refrain from any clapping, heckling, or verbal outbursts in favor or in opposition to a speaker. Individuals that do not adhere to Chapter 74 Rules of Procedure of the Code, particularly Section 74-21, decorum, shall be barred from further appearance before the Commission. Individuals who want to speak on any item on the agenda are asked to fill out a public speaker's card and give it to the city clerk before the item is called. Speakers are asked to speak to the issues, make comments concise and to the point, and refrain from making duplicate comments. All speakers will be limited to one three-minute comment per item. 
If you exceed the three minute allotment, the chair will advise you to finish your comment. If you speak out of turn without permission from the chair and or you don't cease speaking after one warning, you will be escorted out of the chambers. It's the approval of the minutes. Yes, Mayor, we can take the next three, which is um, all three of them are approval of minutes, which is for the special city commission meeting on November 22nd, the regular city commission meeting on November 30th, and the special city commission meeting on December 6th. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Moving right along. The order of business. There have been changes to tonight's agenda as follows. The following are add-ons. Item 12B, discussion re-advisory committees. Item 12C, discussion re-space needs assessment. Item 12D, discussion re an ordinance banning balloon releases. Item 12E, discussion re crosswalk at 189th Street and Collins Avenue. And item 12F, discussion re proactive community policing. Item 10J is deferred. That's resolution re zoning in progress. Do I hear a motion to accept the changes to the agenda? Mayor, uh, I, have one, I have one more. Okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, if we could put on for a 12G uh, Navarro sale. Yes. It'll be very brief. 12G Navarro, uh, Navarro sale. Navarro sale. Okay. Motion? All in favor? Okay. Now for special presentations. Yes, ma'am. That's Commissioner Rabinovich. During National Impaired Driving Prevention Month, we reaffirm our commitment to prevent impaired driving. We remember the victims and honor the memory of those whose lives have been taken or altered at the hands of those driving under the influence. By bringing attention to the importance of this month, we're raising awareness and reminding our neighbors today about the responsibility we all have to each other to drive sober for everyone's safety. On September 18, 2019, tragedy struck our Sunny Isles Beach community. While Maria Romero, a Sunny Isles Beach resident and a mother of three was driving on I-95 with her 15-year-old son, Joel Joey Romero, a woman driving while impaired rammed into their car and forever changed their lives. This proclamation is made today in honor of Joel Joey Romero, who was killed shortly after impact. Joel left behind his mother, Maria, who survived the crash after a month-long coma, along with his father, Joel, and his siblings, Matthew and Luna. No family should ever have to endure the pain and suffering they have experienced. Today we join Joel's mother and their family in cherishing their memory of their loved one while bringing light to their case in the hopes that we can help prevent others from the consequences of driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol. To the Romero family, we honor and we remember Joel, Joey. And we stand with you committed to do everything in our power to prevent impaired driving. Today and throughout the month of December, we remember the victims of impaired driving and we stand united in our resolve to never drive under the influence. I hope you will join me in a brief moment of silence as we reflect upon our individual and collective responsibility to stop impaired driving in its tracks. I'm now going to ask our city clerk to read out loud the pro proclamation and for my fellow government elected officials to join me in presenting it to the Romero family. 
Okay, the proclamation reads, whereas the use of alcohol and other drugs, including over-the-counter and prescription medication, can affect the brain by impairing motor skills, reaction time, and judgment, all of which are critical while driving, and whereas impaired driving as a public health concern is a public health concern because not only does it put the driver at risk, but also endangers the lives and safety of passengers and others sharing the road. And whereas according to the Department of Florida Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles, of all the fatal crashes that occurred in the state of Florida in 2020, 32.8% involved alcohol, drugs, or both. And whereas through the exercise of good judgment, personal responsibility, and the commitment to never drive while under the influence of alcohol, Every community member can play a role in the fight against impaired driving due to drunk, drugged, or distracted driving. And whereas this month, which is considered nationally as one of the deadliest and most dangerous times on American roadways due to an increase in impaired driving, we must all recognize the danger impaired driving can pose for drivers, passengers, pedestrians, and all others sharing the road, and encourage residents and visitors of the city of Sunny Isles Beach to identify, develop, and promote solutions to this critical issue that takes away thousands of lives every year. Now, therefore, do I, Dana Robin Goldman, as mayor and on behalf of the City Commission of the City of Sunny Isles Beach, hereby designate December 2021 as Impaired Driving Prevention Month in the City of Sunny Isles Beach. And the proclamation is on the uh, podium whenever you guys go down for the picture. Thank you so much, Commissioner Rabinovich. Thank you. Item 5B, City Manager's Award presented to law enforcement personnel. One that's quite close. It's, it's, it's about as home as you can get. Thank you, Mayor. Normally, I don't, I don't like to read things, but I think this was important enough that I wrote something to make sure that I didn't mess it up. So, you know, across the country, there's a, there's a lot of negativity and false narrative regarding the police department. But that's not the case here in Sunny Isles Beach. We have the best of the best. We hire quality officers of character. The mayor and commissioners have directed me to find more officers like those that are being honored here tonight. They've explained their care and concern for our officers, including 
directing a feasibility study that will explore the options of a new or expanded police department, new equipment, the latest technology, the best of the best for the best of the best. While other cities are defunding the police, we are supporting our police department. We're adding officers. We're helping our police department any way that we can. I've worked alongside the men and women of the police department for the past nine years, and I'm proud to be associated with them. They are dedicated, professional, they care about our community, and they save lives. These three officers in particular that we're honoring tonight exemplify our city and what we're looking for. In thinking through who to give the inaugural city manager's award to, I never considered that it would be for saving someone's life, but that's exactly what these three did. Because of them, and them alone during this holiday season, someone will be celebrating life, not loss. And for me, that deserves the highest recognition. What is unique about this award is that the person whose life was saved is here tonight, and he is our honorable mayor's husband and I've asked him to help me present the award this evening. Due to their direct life-saving action, I am giving the prestigious City Manager's Achievement Award to Officer Mark Quinlan, Sergeant Brian Snell, and Sergeant Javier Estevez. So if they'd come up, we'd like to present them with the award.
Okay. Thank you again. Um, on to item six, zoning. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening's agenda has two zoning applications. In these matters, the commission sits in a quasi-judicial capacity. The decision of whether or not to approve a zoning variance is not a popularity contest, but must be based upon substantial, competent evidence as it is presented tonight. If you intend to provide testimony on any zoning application, you must be sworn in by the city clerk, and you should also fill out a public speaker's card and give it to the city clerk before the item is called. We will first hear from city staff and then from the applicant. After this, I will allow anyone from the audience who has been sworn in to provide testimony. The zoning applicant has the right to cross-examine any witness and for rebuttal. Please make your comments concisely. Mr. City Clerk, please read your introductory zoning statement. In accordance with the LDRs of the City of Sunny Isles Beach, all items to be heard today have been legally advertised and the newspaper notices have been mailed and posted on the property. Everyone that is going to be speaking, please raise your right arm. That includes the applicants for both uh, applications, both items. Okay. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Uh, Mayor, before we continue, this is for item 6A, which is the a variance application for the property located at 224 Atlantic Avenue. The applicant's name is SG Properties 2416 LLC. And are there any ex party communications? Yes. Mayor, anyone else? No. no. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Um, this application is for property located at 224 Atlantic Avenue. Um, the applicant is SG Properties 2416 LLC. Um, the applicant has submitted a request um, for a variance to decrease the minimum lot width requirements of two proposed parcels of land located at the, above, at the mentioned property. Specifically, the applicant is seeking lot width for the proposed parcel one to the west to be 69.07 feet wide and for the proposed parcel two east to be 60 feet wide, where the minimum lot width is 75 feet per residential lot. Additionally, the applicant is seeking a preliminary subdivision plan subsequent to the variance approval. The subdivide one conforming an existing parcel of land, uh, the parent track, into two subdivided non-conforming laws as described. Um, as a little explanation of background, Atlantic Avenue is one of the islands uh, with a residential zoning description. We have other areas within the city with the same zoning district. Um, and based in our review and our consultant's review, uh, this application is consistent with our city's comprehensive plan and is not consistent with our city land development regulations. The applicant has assented that the application that, and the variance request will not negatively impact the adjacent properties and has obtained uh, letters of no objections from certain residents within the island. Um, the letters are within your application at this moment. Uh, however, as I mentioned, this request does not, uh, it is not consistent with our land development regulations. Um, with that stated, um, our code state and the purpose is to curtail nonconformity and to bring about their eventual improvements or eliminations. So with that said, the applicant uh, representative will continue with the presentation. Good evening. For the record, Javier Avignol with law offices of 1450 Burkle Avenue with the law firm of Bills and Sunberg here on behalf of the owners uh, and applicant, the Borda family. Um, I'm joined by uh, Mr. and Mrs. Borda 
as well as their two daughters here today. Um, as Claudia indicated, uh, this is a request for a variance to allow for a relaxation of the lot width. That said, the requirements of the underlying code are for a 75-foot frontage by 100. That's the contemplated lot size. These lots, even though they would not meet the minimum lot width, um, it, uh, they would exceed the 7,500 square foot minimum lot size. And I want to go, the reason I have this board up in front is because the underlying island was platted, um, it's currently platted, in, it, it, its existing condition is in 30 foot frontages. So when you look at the overwhelming um, majority of the properties on the island, most of them consist of two or three plat existing platted lots, which leaves you with a typical 60 to 90 ranging in uh, lot frontage. And so, we went ahead and did a survey of the entire island with the frontages. And there's a couple of things that we wanted to um, disclose to the board. There's only four of the 60 properties on the island that actually have a lot size um, that is greater than the existing lot in its existing condition. In addition, everything in green that you see has a lot width that is at or less than the proposed lot widths of, uh, of the, pr the proposed lots after subdivision into two. The existing property consists of four and a half platted lots. So what we are proposing, that's how you get to a 60 foot um, frontage for one, as Claudia said, and a 69 for the other. Um, as Claudia also indicated, we went ahead and reached out to uh, a, 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 as many neighbors as we could within. And, um, and we also, um, and I'll submit for the record as well, um, the petitions that we obtained of support for this application, including uh, notably the two abutting properties that would be arguably most impacted by any um, subdivision of this, pro of this proposed property. Um, the purpose behind your land development regulations is to create minimum standards. When the 75 by 100 foot and 7,500 square foot lot size was proposed, the, the thought process behind it was to create um, normalcy um, and to create a certain standard um, across. But what wasn't really taken into account was the island's unique condition and underlying platted circumstance. And so everything that you see in green not only is at or less than the proposed lots, but also doesn't, none of those properties conform to your existing code today either. Um, so so th that's the existing condition. I think that's really Im important to, to continue to, um, to restate because that's, context is important. Um, and, and the context of a neighborhood is what really should be evaluated when looking at a variance. We believe we meet the criteria, and we have articulated that in our, in our uh, letter of intent and, and supporting materials. Um, so we believe we meet the criteria for a variance, and we think in, in addition to meeting the criteria, we believe that the intent of a variance is to look at this particular situation and decide when is it appropriate to vary from your standard regulations. When you have the vast majority of the properties on this island at or below that frontage, it begs the question, what is the actual minimum standard as it pertains here? I would, I would argue to you all that this island and, and the vast majority of the properties here as shown on, on, on the exhibit um, show that the 60 foot frontage that we're proposing for lot one and the 69 point one that we're proposing for lot two are more than in keeping with what the context of the neighborhood um, have. Um, as I said, and I'll submit for the record, uh, we, we not only have this exhibit that already was sub submitted, but we have the petitions that were also submitted with a corresponding locations of the various folks uh, and neighbors that support this application, including, as I mentioned, the two abutting properties. Um, we 
respectfully request any time for rebuttal if necessary. And with that, um, I'm happy to address any questions that you all may have um, and, uh, and available to answer any, any questions. Submit uh, this. Yes. For a variance, aren't there six, six for a variance? I mean, aren't there six established Se criteria? Seven. Six, seven. There are seven. So can you identify how it meets all seven criteria for a variance? Sure. Um, so the seven criteria um, include special conditions or circumstances exist which are peculiar to the land. As I indicated, you have original platted lots that have 30-foot frontages. That was the original intent of the, of, the, of the plat and of this property. That's peculiar. It's not a new condition. This isn't a new lot or unplatted land which would be where your 75 by 100 standard typically arises. Um, those special conditions and circum I, criteria two is those special conditions and circumstances do not result from the actions of the petitioner. We didn't create the underlying plat. We didn't create the underlying um, uh, platted conditions. Um, literal interpretations of the LDRs deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by others. As this exhibit indicates, the vast majority of others on our, pro on our island enjoy the same exact request that we're making here. The alleged hardship is not economic and not deliberately created, um, which again, same exact arguments. We, we, it's not an economic, it's, it's a contextual and planning exercise. Granting the variance com request that conveys the same treatment to the individual owner as the owners of the other lands. Again, as, as we have, I think, articulated and demonstrated by the exhibit, the other owners of land in this island have that same condition. The variance of granted makes possible the reasonable use of the land building or structure. We believe that two single family homes here is appropriate. Um, and again, in context, with the neighborhood, the, the, as, as Claudia also articulated. So the intent is to put two single family homes? Co or? Correct. Okay. The intent is two single family homes, which as Claudia indicated is permitted um, through the LDRs and through the comprehensive plan. And the last criteria is the grant of the variance is in harmony with the general intent and purpose, is not injurious to the neighborhood or otherwise detrimental to the public safety. And we believe it is not either. I'm, I'm happy to address any other questions. I mean, I, I think, Mayor, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I may, I, I, again, the reason that this board and that, we, and that we surveyed the entire island is because I think visually what you'll see is that what is not in harmony and what is not in context is the LDRs as applied to the island. I think the LDRs as applied generally and as applied to perhaps other neighborhoods and other R1 zones is perfectly appropriate. But I think when you view it in context. So um, we should just throw out the LDRs? Absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not, but that's what provides, the, that's what provides a, a variance process so that it could be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. It's absolutely not to be thrown out and not to be taken lightly, but it's to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis to determine when is it appropriate to do it and when it's not appropriate to do it. And I and, think- And the hardship? aspect or there's no okay that's okay continue on continue on I, I I'm I'm happy to address any other questions I don't have any other materials to present to you um, at this time but I, I respectfully so request the idea is to split the two lots and build two homes it's basically. to split the four lots remember there are four but and a half lots gonna, actually it's gonna be like a subdivision so the ultimately two lots so it'll ultimately two be two be. it'll ultimately be two homes mm -hmm. um, correct and so the two homes would be similar to, let's say, this home and this home, or this home and this home. Um, it, that's the, that is the intent, yes. Two single family homes versus one um, you know, large home. And, and I will say, Mayor, that obviously the homes that are proposed must meet the criteria of the underlying LDRs which is important to note as well. So the underlying homes, in spite of being you know, now two homes, you still need to meet all the criteria, including you know, maximum um, sizes and setbacks, et cetera. 
so they would comply. I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Alex Lama. Um, do you know what the frontage is of the uh, two homes uh, abutting the, the, the property we're talking about? Yes. Give me one second. Seventy-four point nine on one side, and the other side is one hundred and eight. One hundred and eight. Okay. And when you say that the planning was supposed to be the plats were thirty-foot frontage, and you're looking at uh, properties that have three or four plats of thirty foot each. Uh, when was it platted? Do we know that? Yes. The I think under, that was yeah. The underlying plat. The year, yeah. I just want to get some 20s, historical. Claudia is saying in the, yeah. in the 20s. In the 20s, okay. Correct. All right. And, uh, and, and, and you had mentioned, just to clarify, because I'm, I'm reading the report from our staff. It yes. says that it is within the, the, the details of the comprehensive plan, but not the LDRs. But you did mention that it was within, uh, it was permitted by our LDRs. So I just want a clarification on that. No, what, are, what are we within? It's, uh, it's yeah, not the, permitted. It's Our not. zoning codes. No, because he had mentioned that the LDRs did permit. I, I, I just want to know if it was just a, a mistake. No, no, no. no. What, what, let me, let me attempt to clarify. Okay. So, what, I think what I, what I tried to articulate was that the uh -huh. proposed homes, after, um, would meet all the other regulations of the LDRs, mm -hmm. absent lot frontage. So we. Again, absent far, the lot frontage. Absent lot frontage, okay. which is the variance mm -hmm. request that's before right. you. Um, we far exceed minimum lot size, which is 7,500 square feet. The proposed lots would be um, 11,102 um, and 9,543 square feet, respectively. So each lot would, would far exceed the minimum 7,500 square foot size. They're just configured um, differently. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Um, in the waterway, there is a small parcel, right? Yes. A little island. Yes. And it's only for parcel number one. Correct. But it's in front of parcel number two. Mm, no, it will only be affiliated with the parcel that it's in front of. No, I understand. But it's going to be in front part of it. It's got the mm. east part is going to be in front of parcel number two. If you can see here on the proposed correct. plat, yes, you're correct that a portion of it is it's in front, be okay. but the access to it is strictly from one of the lots. Only for one. And will only belong to one of the lots. And the square footage that I just provided um, did not include that island as well. So okay. the, that island is an additional 3,117 square feet. To parcel one. To parcel one, okay. correct. I also have a question, yes. and I appreciate uh, Commissioner Lama's uh, question regarding when this was done, because I, I was thinking we we need a little history lesson. I understand that while while your your uh, graph, the other graph was, was very um, compelling, right? It shows us all the green mm -hmm. squares and whatever. Um, I understand that a lot of those were grandfathered in, and so those smaller lots were. Um, existing when our current regulations were created. So it can, Claudia, or can you or Claudia confirm whether that's the case? It's up to you. So, uh, uh, so yes, when the code was adopted, what happened was that all the lots that didn't meet it became legal non-conforming right. lots. But yes, they're assembled as you're seeing here. So several of them are, were already assembled with two lots, some were assembled with three or more. Some of the larger parcels that you see at the end of the island were actually platted as larger lots to begin with. So yes, those lots, right. uh, upon the adoption of the city's code, they became legal non-conforming lots. Right. So you understand that we have to draw the line somewhere. Oh, absolutely. And, and what, what I feel you're asking us to do is to erase the line and to reconsider, to reconsider you know, on a case-by-case -case basis, but basically take 
what is conforming under the regulations that were passed after you know those those particular lots were were already functioning you know for lack of a better word and we're, you're now asking us to take one non one conforming piece of land and and make it non-conforming when it's not grandfathered in like the other lots that you're comparing it to and so my my rhetorical question would be then what's the point of having a code at all if if we're going to just ignore it uh, when when the purpose of it is to to attempt to regulate to the extent that we can because some of it was already existing mm -hmm. we can only right we have to have a starting point from somewhere so i what what would be your response to that why why does it make sense to throw away our code well, I don't feel you're throwing away your code. I actually okay. think you're, you're adopting your code. You're adopting the process. Um, if we were throwing it away, we would be approving this without any process whatsoever. We're, we're actually coming before you, right. asking you to review this from a context standpoint. These properties will never conform, the ones in green. They will never be 75 by 100 square feet, uh, 75 by 100 <laughs> lots. That, that'll never be the existing right. condition of this island. So what I think is unique here, as opposed to throwing away the, the code, as you say, is I 100% don't think you should throw away the code. Okay. And I 100% think that what you should do is apply the code as you are applying it and allow for the variance process to allow you the opportunity to evaluate it and to interpret it from a context standpoint because many times you may find that it's not appropriate to do it. If the vast majority of these properties were 75 by 100, as your code contemplates in a one size fits all fashion, and unfortunately that's not reality. We don't live in a one size fits all um, world, right? So if, if you applied it from that fashion and the vast majority did not exist in this configuration, I could, I could understand where it, the context just doesn't, doesn't match. But in this particular instance, again, this is only one of four properties on the island that are of this size. So it's, it's, it's this property is grossly out of scale in context with the vast majority of the neighbors. And so that's what, that's what I'm appealing to this board for consideration on. So we know how large the other plots are, the, the other four that you mentioned? The other four? I do not have the total sizes of the other four. I could, I could uh, calculate those, but I don't have the other sizes of the other of the mm -hmm. other four. I, they are larger than ours, which currently is um, our total lot. Currently is twenty thousand six hundred and forty-five square feet without the island. But so how much frontage do we have in total? A hundred and twenty-nine. Oh, cor correct. Okay. Now. Do we know the frontage of the other four large plots? So that's on square footage. So there are more than four mm -hmm. lots, to be, to be clear on the, on the record, there are more than four properties that have a larger frontage. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, There are 15 properties of the 60 that have a frontage that is larger than 75 feet. Mm -hmm. The four out of the 60 that I provided is lot size. And we don't know the frontage of those other lot sizes. We do. Um, they, they vary. For instance, mm -hmm. these that are here are 78 feet, so okay. just over the 75 feet. This one is 80, um, so they vary. Uh, there's 88, 89, 90. And these, this exhibit is in your materials. Do so we have any over 120? You have these properties at the end that are over 120. Uh, and I believe, you know, this one is probably about the same size as our property here. But the, there's only one, two, there's only two that have a frontage that appear larger than ours. And we don't know the how many feet we have no, frontage. No, these because of the configuration on the, mm -hmm. the cul-de-sac. Um, the surveyor did, did not, um, did not, was not able to properly provide the frontage on those two. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions? I'll take the public comments. Speaker cards. I think Claudia had a, a response to one of the questions. So to the lot width, um, we have one property that is 130 feet, uh, which is actually this property. We have another one that is 118, another one that is another one 118. Larger than ours. Larger than yours. Which is 130. Um, 235, which is 333. Atlantic Ave. Yeah, we, thank you. <laughs> we, we also provided, what Claudia was referring to, was we also provided a matrix of every property on the island that includes lot frontage um, and, and total lot size. Um, this exhibit also includes, you know, medians as well, which show that the, the lot, proposed lot frontages and proposed lot size are well within the, the medians of, of the existing conditions. So essentially those two properties in the cul-de-sac, if mm -hmm. they wanted to be subdivided, they would meet the requirements of the minimum frontage. Now that other property that we have at the other end that you said that is similar to this property, how many feet is it fronted? So the frontage is, uh, it's four lots. So, but note that the the lot on the edge mm -hmm. is not is an irregular shaped lot, so it's it, it from a lot oh, size yeah. standpoint, it, it likely has the 30 feet of frontage, but you can see that it. This one here, 200, 200 Atlantic. I believe it has. So we'll meet the requirement of the frontage, but not the the density or the square footage. It's 118 feet to be exact, mm -hmm. and it's a 17,444 square foot lot. So it's smaller. Thank you yes. very much. We have some Thank public you. speakers. Um, Ari Steiger. Can you state your name and address for the record? Ari Steiger, 262 Atlantic Island. I think that our island is designated for single family homes on the lots that are right there now. If we give a variance to this house, I guarantee you there's four more houses that will come in for a variance. And I don't think that any, maybe a couple of the neighbors would like it if they have the bigger lot, but the old neighbors that we are living there for 30 years do not appreciate to do two houses on a lot. Therefore, I don't think you should grant any variances for, for, you know, especially variance for, for width or, or, or length because it's not appropriate. So think twice about it and, and deny it because we're going to open a can of worm for the rest of the island and it's going to set forward for, for more people that, that I know that just bought lots and, and have the designation to, to build two homes on it. Thank you. Thank you. Loretta Muffson. Can you state your name and address for the record? Yes, hi, I'm Loretta Muffson. I live at 310 Atlantic Isle. Um, I, I just have some concerns regarding the request. Um, it was mentioned that neighbors were interviewed or asked. Um, I was not. Um, no one approached me or my husband. Maybe because there was a previous uh, meeting uh, about a lot next to us and people knew that I was kind of against that. So maybe that's why I was not approached. Um, it was stated that Atlantic Island Civic Association uh, approved this. Um, I'm the secretary and the treasurer of the association and we as an entity never discussed it. Um, let alone approve it. So I just want to make sure that that's known. Um, regarding number four, setbacks, number five, lot coverage, number six, floor area ratio, and number seven, building space. The, re the report says it's not applicable because it's currently a, a vacant lot. But my concern is that, <clears throat> you know, if this gets approved, then probably other variances will be requested. Um, height, width, you know, the setbacks. Um, because, you know, when you have a, a smaller lot, you know, people these days want to build as much as they can 
on what they have. Um, and I, I'm afraid it's going to set a precedent. Um, and I do believe there are other lots in the island <clears throat> that people own, and they're considering, you know, they're watching this because they're considering splitting their lot too. So I don't, I don't think it's a good precedent to start. Um, the homes that, that, you know, were plotted before, back in the day, you know, they built smaller homes. They fit the lot. Um, today, that's not the case. Um, people try to build as much as they can on the property they have, and um, I just don't think that's good for our neighborhood and the aesthetics of it. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, w Warren Campbell and John Campbell. Can you state your name and address for the record? Warren Campbell, 214 Atlantic Avenue. Uh, I think the attorney that was making the case hit the nail on the head. It's the context of the neighborhood and the uniqueness of the island. I think before you actually came up with the, the land development or however you phrased it to have the 75 foot frontage, uh, it kind of put the, the cart ahead of the horse because they didn't really look at the island as it was originally platted. And that goes back to the late 1800s. I think you should look at it on a case-by-case -case basis because of its uniqueness. There are people there that are building beautiful homes and <laughs> our neighbors are correct. They will build as much as they can. But what they're building is very nice looking. As a matter of fact, the design that we were presented, because we abut the, the, the neighbor that tried to get the variance, uh, it's a beautiful home, very similar to the ones already there, which take up as much land as the neighboring homes. So I think you have to look at it as a unique situation. It's not a cookie cutter neighborhood. Every lot is different. Thank you. He's, the speaker was against, but um, it's okay. The speaking card was for against. Um, Humberto Ortiz. Can you state your name and address Hi, for the record? Humberto Ortiz, 278 Atlantic Isle. Um, I just want to say, and I'm in for uh, the splitting of the lot. Um, not only, and I've known the boarders for many, many years, not only are they a beautiful family, but as you can tell, they have two girls that are growing up and will grow up in our community. Um, also, I want to say that my lot is also at, at 60 feet, and, uh, and you don't need more space. I think that the more uh, uh, families that we can bring into the island, which is a beautiful island, uh, the better it is. It's uh, the more taxes that we can receive. So. Um, Ari's lot, I know that he talks about it, but Ari's lot is 60, is 60 feet wide himself. Uh, one of the lots that we're talking about that's a little bit bigger is my next door neighbor, it's Tommy Sessa's lot. And Tommy's never going to sell. And he himself has signed the petition saying that it's okay for him to split the lot. So I'm um, 100 again for it and, and I hope that that beautiful family can move into our island. It'll be an asset to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Maggie Gordo, can you state your name and address for the record? Good evening. Uh, my name is Maggie Gordo. I'm uh, 16711 Collins Avenue. And I'm here continuing my constant appeal to you to look at the overdevelopment of our beautiful city. Why am I saying this? Because we are talking about a beautiful family that is not told not to build a beautiful home in a beautiful lot, but that wants to have two beautiful families to be there. And there will be two beautiful families that we have to evacuate. So I am not here to be against any beautiful families, but I am here to tell you that you were elected to stop overdevelopment. Over if we bring two families instead of one, then we have more density, and even though it's, the, uh, it's conforming to the comprehensive plan, in this case, 
is non-conforming, and we know for a fact that for years we have not taken care of the issue of the town center. That is a problem for us. And you, as your newly elected, we voted you in to change the culture. The culture has to be, we need to do studies, we need to do data, and whatever is allowed in the, in the law is what should be built. I, I don't want to be against anyone, but I want to be for the city of Sony High Beach. We need to take care of the overdevelopment, and you cannot do it by bringing more people and making a non-conforming law. That to me is just incredible that we are now going to legally agree that we're going to take a perfectly good conforming law and turn it into a non-conforming law for someone to build again and bring another family. So the family can take the two lots and build a beautiful home and take care of the family there, but we need to take care of our city. Our city is overdeveloped and we need to fix it. Please think about that. Thank you. Okay, no more, there are no more public speaker cards, so wanna open it up for discussion? Yeah. They're the owners, yeah, so I'm the representative. Yes? Uh, my name is Mario Borda. I'm the owner of the property, and I come basically to speak on behalf of my family. Now, we came to this island because, uh, I mean, we were introduced to the island by one of our good friends, Humberto Ortiz, who spoke on our behalf. His property is 60 feet. I mean, we went through all this analysis trying to determine what is conforming, what's non-conforming, but how do you define that? I mean, more than 50% of your lots are less than 60 feet. I mean, some of the people who are opposing our property have 60 feet. 72% of these lots are 60 feet or smaller. So what we're proposing is we're proposing to build two homes, one for each of our daughters. I mean, that's our intent. Our intent is not to, to turn this into a massive, massive development or to try to change the city. I mean, we're just trying to build two homes similar to like, these two, or these two, or these two, or these two, or these two. I mean, we have all of these here. Each of these is 60 feet. So that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no other questions, yeah. Claudia, do we foresee any future variances? It's too early to answer that question. Uh, we don't know until actually we move forward, if we move forward with this, and then we'll get a site plan. But we, we will not know until we see the site plan, and then we evaluate if that site plan includes or not any variances requests. But as um, uh, Council has mentioned, if it comes and includes a variance, it will have to come back in front of you for that decision to be made. And I could, I could um, say uh, that we have no intention of asking for additional variances, but as Claudia just said, anything that we would request that is outside of the uh, LDR, so to address one of the neighbor's concerns with it leading to additional uh, LDR variance requests, that would have to come before you. And again, to answer the conversation that we had earlier, that's where context is incredibly important and where um, you have the ability to say contextually, you know, that that would not be the uh, appropriate uh, instance to do so. There's no further discussion. Then a motion. Any of the, made. any of the, uh, any commissioners have any? You have any comments? I, I'd like to make some comments. So, there's a tough one, but I mean. If you look ahead 20, 30, 40 years, you know, down the road, you know, what would prevent 
your neighbor that has a frontage of 108 feet, what would prevent that neighbor or what would guarantee the city that he would not come before us and ask for a variance to have a two frontages of 54 feet each, right? Right now you're asking for 60 and 69, I believe, right? So it kind of begs the question, I mean, are we, there's unintended consequences and uh, you know, we're, we're opening the Pandora's box to, you know, 30, 40 years down the road. There's some houses in that island that are quite old already. So eventually, you know, those are gonna be bought or the family is gonna rebuild there. And that's my concern. My concern is not so much now, but eventually, you know, we're looking at a city that, you know, I've been here over 30 years and not in my wildest dreams that I, envision all of this that's happening. So, you know, I, um, I am concerned about that. You know, it's like, what, you know, with a straight face, how can I would deny your neighbor that has a frontage of 108 feet, denying from partitioning that into 54 feet of frontage? Uh, so I, I understand that you're saying that you, we got to look at the context, but I think what I'm saying is that that's part of the context too. You know, you're looking, you got to look ahead. And uh, that's where my doubts come in, you know, and my, let's say, apprehensions come in. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm not in favor of this lot split. I'm, I'm reviewing this uh, upon the advice of uh, both staff and council, and I'm not, I'm not in favor of, uh, I'm not in favor of the lot split. I would add to, to Commissioner Lama's comment. I, I, don't, I don't think we're looking at 30, 40 years. I think we're probably looking at five, 10 years. Uh, so, uh, and to me, it's just counterintuitive to, to take one conforming lot and turn it into two non-conforming lots. Um, when I, and I, I, I appreciate the, the context argument, but part of that context is the grandfathered in um, lots. They existed before the, the, the regulations were created, and so there's nothing we can do with those. Um, so they, they exist, and I understand it's, it's, a, it's a mismatched situation, and I appreciate it's a very creative argument, but at the end of the day, these regulations existed when this particular purchase was made. Uh, and you know, I, and I, it was a risk taken, a calculated risk, I suppose, that thinking that you could turn it into two. But I, I, to me, if, if we do that, not only are we opening the door, um, I, I do think it's a bit of a can of worms, um, but, um, but I also feel that there's no point in having the code. So, um, and as, as um, Ms. Gordo said, you know, this is not preventing uh, a lovely family from moving into the city and, and having a, a lovely life. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll just be in a, they now have the option to build a bigger house on a bigger lot if that's what they choose to do. Uh, so for that reason, it's just to me, it, that the bottom line is to me it feels very counterintuitive to, to go from conforming to non-conforming when our purpose is supposed to be in the other direction. I have to say that I also find the piece of island lot also a, a, a future issue as well. Because as of right now, with the amount of lot that you have, you have this piece of lot island there that is in front of both, in the views of both lots. And it's, I find that to be also, if we're looking at each specific particular case, I find that as also an issue. So I don't know. We Motion to deny, motion to, does, if anybody has a motion. Do, do we? We can either take a motion to deny the application or a motion to approve and see if that one passes. Either way, you know, a motion needs to I'll, be made. I'll make a motion, I'll make a motion to deny. Okay. Commissioner Lama, this is a motion to deny. To deny. Yeah, I agree. Yes. Commissioner Stuvesant? Commissioner Rabinovich? Agree. So? Ag agree. Vice Mayor Viscaro? Yes. Mayor Goldman? Yes. 
the application as an item. We can move along there. Uh, the next item is 6B. It's an application for a balcony enclosure for the property located at 17875 Collins Avenue, Unit 4806. The applicants are Elias Saul and Diana Grimberg. And before we move forward, are there any ex party communications for this application? Um, no one. No. No. Perfect, thank you. Mayor Vice Mayor Commissioners, um, this application is a request to modify the site plan and a transfer development rights. Did we add that item, Mauricio, to this request? So, okay. I forgot to mention that. So yes, so we're gonna hear this companion item, which is 10A, and 10A is a resolution approving the purchase and assignment of transfer development rights in the amount of 343 square feet of floor area ratio and zero dwelling units from the city's public TDR bank account to Elias Saul and Diana Grimberg, authorizing the development services director to withdraw 343 square feet of FAR and zero dwelling units from the city's public TDR bank account and assigning the 343 square feet of FAR to the property located at 17875 and 178, 178 Collins Avenue, unit 4806. Basically, as my Mauricio mentioned, uh, this is to enclose a balcony and an existing unit at Aqualina. They will be enclosing and adding a square footage to their unit by 343 square feet. Um, this will bring the overall floor area ratio for the entire building to 806,893 square feet of floor area ratio. Um, uh, this um, application is also requesting TDRs. That is where the increase of floor area ratio will come from. Uh, with that said, um, this application is consistent with our comprehensive plan and with our land development regulations. This is not a variance or anything of that sort that's similar in the past. Also, this have come in front um, to you. Um, the owners of the units are here if you have any questions, um, but I don't think so. Um, if, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to address them. This is our standard, uh, yeah. Correct. <laughs> our yeah. cookie cutter. TDR application. For balconies, correct. Okay. Um, all conditions are set up in the staff report. Um, the price of TDRs is a typical $125 per square feet. Are we combining this also with the Yes, this is combined with yeah. 10A. Okay. Not, not much to add. Questions? No questions on my part. Not, not much to add. This is a pretty uh, standard, straightforward application. No public comments, uh, so I think that's for this one. okay. So we get a motion. Motion to approve. Sorry. All in favor? No, this is a roll call, Mayor. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, Commissioner Rabinovich. Aye. Commissioner Silvasant. Aye. Commissioner Lama. Yes. Vice Mayor Viscaro. Yes. Mayor Goldman. Yes. The application is approved. Thank you. Next item. Those are, uh, okay. that's, we're on 7A? Yes, uh, ordinance is first reading. Okay, 7A is an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Sunny Isles Beach, Florida, creating Chapter 6 of the City of Sunny Isles Beach Code of Ordinances to be titled Boards, Commissions, and Committees to provide for the creation of an Environment Sustainability Advisory Committee, stating the purpose, powers, and duties of the committee, providing for member qualifications, providing for a repealer, providing for severability, providing for codification, providing for an effective date. This is first reading. Okay. okay. I would like to make a few comments before the next items are introduced and discussed by my colleagues. So this, this pertains to both item 7A and 7B 
the ordinance uh, creating not only the sustainability committee, but the ordinance creating a pedestrian and mobility safety committee. I can't tell you how many times residents have approached me over the years and asked, how can I get more involved in our city? Or how can I help our city? These residents are ready, willing, and able to help our city meet the challenges we face and move our city forward together as one community. Our city is blessed to have an incredible pool of residents with expertise and experience in an array of fields. They also understand firsthand some of the challenges we face. As you know, our city's charter and ordinances already have provisions dealing with citizen advisory boards. It's something we can get moving in a matter of weeks. Yet for too many years, our residents have not been given an opportunity to serve our city in a meaningful way. They feel that they have been shut out of the process. They feel ignored. That will change starting with tonight's agenda items to form two standing advisory committees. It's time to get more of our residents involved in a meaningful way so we as a commission can make the best decisions possible. The first committee, again, in, not in this order, is the Pedestrian Mobility Safety Advisory Board. I don't have to tell anyone here tonight or listening at home that taming the deadly chaos on our streets is a top priority. Residents are tired of hearing excuses from City Hall about why our streets are so treacherous for pedestrians, joggers, bicyclists, and other motorists. We are working on a host of ideas to finally deal with this issue in a comprehensive manner. Some are shorter term solutions, others will require a longer term approach. We must engage in this two track approach if we want to see at least some tangible results in months instead of years. Of course, we will need cooperation for our, our county and state partners both here and in Tallahassee, but there are several things we can do relatively quickly. You have probably noticed an increased police presence on our roads recently. I want to thank our police tremendously for committing to help combat this dangerous situation. But we can never police ourselves out, out of danger. Our police will tell you that them, themselves. We need other major road safety measures. The city manager and his administration will roll out other proposals to this, to, out other proposals to this new committee. The citizens will then absorb, tweak, and suggest ways to improve them. One last comment about this subject. I know some people might wonder about the cost to make our roads safer and more aesthetically pleasing. I can tell you the cost of not doing something meaningful will be a lot more in lives and family tragedies. And we will have tens of millions of dollars to spend on these projects if we decide not to build pedestrian bridges that few residents want and fewer will use. The second committee, and again, in, in, in reverse order, is the Environment and Sustainability Advisory Board. This citizen committee will deal with several issues that not only affect our health and safety, but our quality of life. For instance, the city manager will be unveiling a major tree planting initiative soon. Our residents will weigh in on the details of his plan, which will beautify our city and make it more environmentally sustainable. Our city also faces threats from leaking sanitary sewer pipes. As you know, our entire area suffers from periodic no-swim advisories because of dangerous levels of fecal bacteria. We literally have raw sewage flowing into our waterways. The county technically is responsible for our sewer service, but our city needs to take the lead in, in dealing with this problem before it causes an environmental and economic catastrophe. There's also the issue of stormwater runoff that affects our water quality. Again, our waterways and beaches are the crown jewels of our city. We must do everything to protect them. We also must assess the quality of our drinking water and its supply infrastructure. Our new city manager already has some ideas on this subject. Both of these areas also involve infrastructure controlled by others, in this case, the county and our neighbors in North Miami Beach. But once again, our city absolutely must take the lead on these issues to ensure our residents' safety and quality of life. I now would like to begin the discussion with my colleagues by asking for a motion to introduce these ordinances on first reading. I suggest we discuss both at the same time since they are almost identical in substance. Okay, so we have the sustainability if, committee. 
Okay, so just to clear up the record, we can consider both, but it'll be two separate votes. Okay. And two separate public comment sections. Okay, so open for comments. Um, for the, do you want to do uh, discussion of amongst the commission first or public comments? Um, we, can do, um, we can do public comments. Okay. okay. Uh, we have a comment, Larissa Svechen. Please state your name and address for the record. I know the drill. Hi, Larissa Svechen, 19140 Atlantic Avenue. Mine is not a comment. I have a question. First of all, I, I'm thrilled that you have all these new ideas um, from the city manager. That's great. And that you're finally looking at committees that are going to be based on issues like we have with the Public Arts Committee, which is fantastic, because then people can really focus on what they're passionate about. My question is, um, logistical. What are the implications as far as they have to um, follow sunshine? How often they're going to meet? Do we have to hire more staff? That sort of thing. If you can just address those questions. They will be, um, Stan, um, you know, you might want to comment, but uh, certainly they will be consistent with the charter and um, formed in, in, in a similar manner to which the, uh, the PAC was, was formed. So this is all per charter in the code. And these are, these are advisory boards. These are not. Um, Correct. Yeah. These are not, um, these are advisory committees. I, I asked these questions in, in my agenda review because I was thinking, you know, along the same lines. So, because uh, I, I know that there's times that sometimes sunshine applies and other times it doesn't. And so I, I wanted clarification on that as well. Uh, and what um, uh, the city clerk uh, told me is that if they're fact-finding committees and they are uh, not making recommendations, then they're not subject to sunshine. But uh, if, they, if they're advisory in nature, then they, they are subject to sunshine and they would function much like, like the other committees. Am I getting that right? Yes, and, and the city yeah. attorney can correct me if I'm yeah. wrong. Again, if they're fact-finding and they're limited to just gathering the facts and presenting them to the commission, then they're not bound by the sunshine. But the minute that they make a, re a recommendation or they start to um, eliminate facts to present them to you, then that becomes um, a board that needs to function under the sunshine. And since these uh, apparently are both advisory committees, that then they would both require uh, the same requirements that you have for notif notification of uh, their meetings uh, public opportunity to to come and uh, and uh, minutes be taken. I did have a, another question. I'm sorry, I didn't know if we were done with the comments. Is there any other comments? Yes, we have another public speaker's card, Jerry Joseph. Can you state your name and address for the record? Well, my name is Jerry Joseph, 185 60 North Bay Road. Um, I'd like to say that I believe these committees are an expansion of government and wasteful. Uh, we currently have a workshop process that's working fine. And uh, with the addition of citywide suggestion boxes, I believe that uh, that should suit the needs and that these uh, committees should not be needed. Thank you. No more public speakers? There's none. Here. Of course, I view these as high priority um, substantive areas and um, high priority commissions in the same way that the PAC was formed. Again, uh, a, a specific purpose and uh, assembling, assembling committee and participation. Um, absolutely in favor of, uh, you know, moving, moving these committees forward. I think they would be a great addition for our community. I think that, especially as being a resident that was recently appointed, I, um, I have felt very, you know, frustrated and the pushback that my concerns, my suggestions weren't really being acknowledged. I think this is a great opportunity 
and it's time to open up these communication lines and really invite our residents to be part of the decision making in our city. And certainly these, uh, certainly these subject areas are of, of, of utmost importance for the city. We had this, this, um, this, a version of this conversation uh, some time ago in the context of the, the city advisory committee that I, that I felt was not, it just wasn't really working anymore because it was such a, a structured in a way of a fish, fishing expedition. And we talked before about having project specific um, committees and, and exploring that. Uh, creating committees that, so I think that this is that, a compromise or that where you're giving them a subject and you're creating a committee uh, and I think it's worth exploring uh, the there has been a void in in terms of um, the residents ability to participate uh, there, there just it's been a void it's it's been uh, when the CAC in my opinion properly stopped um, it, there was not there was no new opportunities created and I think this is Giving, giving, we have the PAC as an example of, of a successful um, template. And if we have a, a focus and we can give some direction, um, I, I think it's worth exploring. And then if it ends up, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but at least we're creating the opportunity. Uh, we haven't done that in, in several years. I, I, it's, it's, worth, it's worth exploring. I have a question. So it will work like the Historic Preservation Committee, basically, right? Because the idea is for them to do recommendations. Yes, the essentially the both committees that are being created would research, gather the information, make recommendations to the commission based on what their focus is. In these two, in these two in these two subject areas, and which I, are yeah. high high you know high relevance to I our city. I think it's an amazing idea because everyone has different motivation inspiration, what you really want to see changes. And bringing new ideas, fresh ideas, I think it, it will help. I think it will, it's the purpose of it. And I, I'm for it, I like it. I will have, like to participate basically in these committees and have my, my, my little, to help find solutions. So I think if we allow that to the public, we can feel like we are part of a community. That's uh, out of order. So I, I, I'm for these uh, committees too. I think uh, like uh, Vice Mayor uh, Biscara said that uh, these are, let's say we have specific, let's say tasks that are assigned. And I think there's a, let's say there's a clear direction on where these committees, what they need to accomplish. Um, so I'm for those. Um, what, what I would like to know is how we would go about choosing the members. I know with the city advisor committee, I think each commissioner would get one pick. I believe the mayor would get two picks. I, so I, I'm just trying to understand how we would form these. And um, let's say, this is another question that came up. Let's say we can't form these. These are ordinances. Are we breaking our own law? No, no, uh, we're, gonna, <laughs> we're gonna use the, the PAC as our model. As we're, our we're, model. Gonna, okay. we're gonna put out uh, uh, like basically, right, and mm -hmm. we, we would receive uh, applications, applications or resumes, okay. and we have a very highly qualified panel that for the PAC, and we're, we're looking to model that in that fashion. People, as, the, as these uh, proposed ordinance state, that we're looking for requisite industry experience Correct. or interest mm -hmm. in the subject matter, so we have a more focused committee mm -hmm. with, you know, again, experience. Okay background skill sets that can really, you know, contribute or lend to that particular subject matter. Okay. And when they meet anyway, it's gonna be open to the public, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So anybody can come and you also have have even if they're everything. not part of the board, they can participate. Okay. Yes, okay. absolutely. Well they can Good. attend. I don't know about participation. Right? Attend. Right. But they can attend. Oh. I guess that depends on the rules. But. Oh okay. No, the, these are bound by the sunshine, so they are allowed to participate. Okay. And attend, yeah, and the city obviously. advisor committee, yeah. people will come yes. up and there will be a conversation back and forth. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Okay, I think so. we have, so 
we want, if we, do we have a motion? Do we take this separate we need a or? Uh, yes, this would be for 7 7A. 7A for the Environment and Sustainability Committee. Do we have a motion? Motion. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Or do we take uh, a roll? This a, is roll a roll call. call. Okay. Okay. Commissioner I'll get that right. <laughs> Commissioner Suvasant? Commissioner Lama? Yes. Commissioner Rubinovich? Aye. Vice Mayor Viscaro? Yes. Mayor Goldman? Yes. The ordinance passes on first reading. Second reading will be scheduled for January. Okay, we'll take a separate, uh, yes. we'll take now, a motion. Uh, let me just read it into the record. Uh, 7B is an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Sunny Isles Beach, Florida, amending Chapter 6 of the City of Sunny Isles Beach Code of Ordinances to provide for the establishment of a pedestrian and mobility safety advisory committee stating the purpose, powers, and duties of the committee, providing for member qualifications, providing for repealer, providing for severability, providing for codification, providing for an effective date. And this is first reading. Second. Okay. Um, Commissioner Rabinovich? Aye. Commissioner Stuvesant? Aye. Commissioner Lamo? Yes. Vice Mayor Viscaro? Yes. Mayor Goldman? Yes. The ordinance passes on first reading. Second reading will be scheduled for January. Okay, on to item 10A. 10A was already heard. It was the companion item That's for right. 6B. That's, so we're going to 10B. The 10B is a resolution authorizing the disposal of electronic equipment as surplus property through Electronic Recycling Center, Inc. Good evening, our Honorable Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, this uh, item before you is uh, for authorization to dispose of our surplus equipment. As we generally do, we ask the school if they can use any of the equipment and um, if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to ask to answer. Um, so, uh, just one point. So, you had um, for this equipment, you um, before you give to this organization, you had approached, I guess, the school or other entities in the city. It's, or yes, in, I within am, the I'm premises. waiting for final word from the school. Any equipment that they want, we will give to them. And the rest of it, quite honestly, most of it is non functional and it is very old. So, it is. Not useful. Oh, okay. Thank you. Any comments? Can we also offer it to the high school because maybe they can use it for experiment to open in, you know, to our Alonso and Tracy Morning High School? I can certainly if possible. do that. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Good. Good. Okay. Motion. Motion. Do you have a motion? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you for coming back. Okay. 10C is a resolution approving an increase in spending authority with this and Krupp Elevator Corporation for elevator maintenance services. Honorable Mayor and Commission, um, we have a five year agreement in place with uh, this and Krupp, which is now TK Elevator. They service the two elevators at the Gateway Pedestrian Bridge. Um, so this um, request is for an increase in authorized spending with them. We've had some additional service calls over the year, the years, and there's been a few increases in the annual maintenance as well. So this is a request for some additional funds to get us through the remainder of the agreement. Any, any comments? Any of my colleagues? No. Okay. Do you have a motion? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Tendi is a resolution approving a memorandum of understanding between the city of Sunny Isles Beach by and through its police department and the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for the purpose of facilitating investigations of certain police related incidents. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor and Commission. This is a memorandum of understanding that we're trying to enter into with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement to handle all investigations involving police shootings or in custody deaths 
um, involving the Sunny Isles Beach Police Department. In the past, we've always used the services of the Miami-Dade Police Department, uh, but in the interest of keeping everything transparent and uniform, all most agencies in Florida so far are switching over to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement doing everybody's. We're one of the, probably the last ones in Dade County so far going to this, but most agencies in South Florida are working towards it. Any, any comments? No. I think we're all in. I think it sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good. No. <laughs> Do you have a motion? So moved. Second. Anyone? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Tenney. Tenney is a resolution requesting a waiver of the bidding requirements set forth in Chapter 62 of the City Code, approving an agreement with DuraServe Corp which is doing business as Overhead Door Company of South Florida for the purchase and installation of a security gate for the government center parking garage. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners, Senior Manager and Staff. This uh, agreement is for security gates at the bottom level of the garage entrance that'll be fob activated um, for city personnel, cars, vehicles, work vehicles. Um, we went out and researched different types of high-speed gates that are applicable for this uh, operation for what we do at the city. Uh, this company was the best company with the best price. Happy to see some uh, ink beefed up security. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be able to get in and out of the building. <laughs> that would not be a problem. There's okay. always, these gates have like a manual override. If there was ever, ever an issue, you just unhook them and you can open them. So, you know, security or emergency access is not an issue. Good to hear. So, so, so just to understand, the police cars will have some sort of, how would they go in? They will have a transponder or something and the gates yeah. will, and we, city staff, will have like a fob or something, right? Yeah, everybody, every, every vehicle we want to use gets registered with a fob. Okay. So the original contract has 400. Um, so that way all the inspector vehicles, police vehicles, motorcycles, uh, city staff that's using the garage will, will have that with their cars. And so when you say fob, just trying to understand, I, I'm not going to have a fob and then press it to the no, panel. It'll, it'll it's just going to automatically, uh, it's like going to be in the car room. and they'll automatically right. open up. It'll probably okay. be a, like a windshield sticker on your car that you know, it's there, and then okay. they can be deactivated if people come and go, yeah. we can deactivate them. And those are gonna open up with enough time, let's say a pol there's a police emergency, they need to exit quickly of the parking structure, it, it will open up with enough time for them to uh, go yeah, through so what, we're, what we're doing on the exit side way. is because yeah. of the ramp down on the exit side, mm -hmm. we're actually gonna put the uh, receiving unit farther up the ramp, so as the cars come around the turn, it'll activate, the door will open before you get to the bottom. Okay. All right. Thank you. And these are fairly high speed. Um, if you wanted to see one in action, the new garage on uh, Kings Point Drive that was just put in um, has these gates in them, and you can see how quickly they go up and down. Okay. And there, is, there was only one company, right? That it was qualified, able, and they That's responded. Correct. Because you guys did a long research, we can only find really one right. that could I, give I, this service, right? That's correct. Okay. I had a couple that were interested. They didn't get back to me with the proper bid information. Correct. Some of them didn't want to go into Dade County because they're just Broward County. So um, these okay. were the best guys to do the job, and we've okay. seen their product. Perfect. I think, okay, thank go ahead. You. we're all in favor. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a motion? I, motion? I, just, I just wanted to make a comment oh, because in, independent of, of the gate, which which sounds good, um, you know, it's, it's greater security, and I believe it, it'll, it'll work towards the accreditation of the police department. I think that's one of the requirements. But we had a previous discussion about accessibility to, to the police department. So if we put a gate at the garage and... I need to access the police department at two in the morning. We need to address that simultaneously with this. Uh, how are we gonna do that? 
We're looking at options now, and we will be prepared to have that in place prior to the installation right. of the gate. Okay, and being the with the like the um, the security guard uh, using the lobby, what are we what are we looking at? That's the tentative plan, but we're okay. looking at all options. Okay. Yes. I just want to make sure we don't we don't do that, and then I can't access the, the police department at two in the morning on a Sunday. Correct. Right. Okay. Correct. Yes. Take a motion. So moved. Second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Next item. 10F is a resolution um, approving an amendment, a seventh amendment to the agreement with the Lee Richards Design Associates to provide for an additional renewal term and additional services related to the medita meditation garden. Honorable Mayor and City Commission, um, this is a renewal. We have um, Kathy O'Leary Richards Design Associates um, on contract for plan review, which is reimbursable expenses, um, minor designs, and uh, monthly inspections. And we had also contracted with her to design the meditation garden. That project had been delayed, so now that we are re-engaging her, um, there's been an increase in some fees. So this Seventh Amendment will get us through another full year of her services and um, a little added funds for the meditation garden. And then next year we'll be going out to bid for a new landscape architect. You're happy? Yes. We're happy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> She's good. She helped write our bids. She, um, we can call on her for anything. So. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Some, some things in works. Yes. Okay. All right. Any comments or can we have a motion? Can some? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Next Ten, item. 10G is a resolution approving change order number 32 relating to the agreement with Roll Global Networks for the Collins Avenue Utilities on the Grounding Project. As you just heard two days ago in the workshop, Paul Abbott um, gave a great presentation on where we stand with the Golden Shores Undergrounding and, and also the um, Collins Avenue. We are nearing the finish line. Uh, this additional funds and time is to finish the, finish the project, which is the street lights on Collins Avenue. Any comments? Can I get a motion? Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. 10H. 10H is a resolution ratifying an agreement with the Stout Group Inc. for the construction of the Golden Shores Utility on the grounding project. This item was before you previously, and you approved it in substantially that form in this exact same amount, and it is now for you, uh, before you for ratification as the resolution required. This is for the undergrounding of the Golden Shores community and the urban trail and the sidewalk on Atlantic. I have some I have public speakers cards. Um, Steve Tratner, can you state your name and address for the record? Good evening, Steve Tratner, 265 187th Street. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. As a 28-year resident of Golden Shores, first I want to say thank you. Uh, a lot of us do not take this project lightly. Six million dollars is a huge investment for the city. We, we recognize that. But we're also very, very excited. This is the final stage of what's been a very long underground project for our utilities. Um, also, glad to see some of the other things that we're throwing into this, including sidewalks, uh, the pedestrian walkway, which is something that uh, Juan Crespi and I have uh, recommended to the Commission quite a while back. Um, but I, I read through the agreement between the city and the Stout Group, which, by the way, also was extremely thorough, so I appreciate that as well. Um, very, very well written. Um, it addressed a lot of the questions and concerns I have uh, and a lot of us in, this, in the community have. Uh, but there are a few exceptions to that, so um, I wrote those down here and I didn't want to forget any of them. So I'll ask the questions um, if you need me to re repeat them later, but I'll, you know, to, in lieu of the time that I have, I'll ask the questions and you can address these later. 
Uh, number one is the start date, the notice to proceed. Paul Abbott mentioned it would be sometime in February, although that wasn't very specific, so um, it'd be great to get some definitive time on that. Um, overall, uh, it would be great if we can get a uh, kind of a series of events of when things are going to occur over the 18-month period and some periodic updates. So if there's going to be any service interruptions, obstructions, uh, detours, things of that nature, it'd be good to alert uh, the neighborhood in advance of those things. Uh, specifically in section 7.16.3, it states that um, the contractor will have to um, work with the city to obtain consent from the property owners before they access uh, those properties. I'm curious how we're going to go about actually acquiring or obtaining that consent from the property owners and how much advance notice will be given the property owners when they have to access their property. Uh, and then the very next section, 7.16.4, um, in that section it states that the contractor shall notify the property owners no less than two days in advance of any impact on the homeowner. Um, it, and it says, I specifically it requires two days advance notice. Due to the fact that, oh, I'm running out of time. Due to the fact that a lot of people are working from home right now, um, that impact could actually be greater than it would be otherwise. So I would rather ask if, we, if the contract's not all, already executed, if we can push that to at least four days so that homeowners have the opportunity to be able to make other arrangements should they need to. Um, in addition to that, if we can add to the language um, any excessive noise, because again, if they're doing conference calls and video conferencing from home, the pounding in the street could really be a, uh, an annoyance to, for the property owners. Uh, let's see. And um, in section 13.2, uh, the comprehensive general liability. May I continue? Very, very in, in the general liability section, it does not specifically call out liability to the property owners only to the city. I want to make sure that the property owners are included in that. And then who's going to be the arbiter should there be any property damage? I wouldn't want to leave that up to the property owners to have to deal directly with the contractor or the contractor's insurance company. Um, I've been in that situation before, um, and it took a year and a half to get something done. Steve, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Ed, Valerie. <laughs> a lot of that. Uh, it's, it's going to have to be answered by Paul, um, you know, since he's the, the manager of the project. So um, we'll get with him. Uh, as you know, he's left, left the, the building uh, for the next month, but Valerie's in touch with him very frequently. So we'll work on some of those things and, and report back to you. I, I think that one of, the, one of the virtues of this particular, this, this contractor was that we were, you know, they specifically had a staging plan, and that was what distinguished them from the from the lowest bidder. So that's why we we chose because of their attention to the whole the whole staging process, and that was that was high in the high in the criteria for approving this particular vendor. Right? Correct. In order to try to avoid impacts to the homeowners in, in the neighborhood. Okay. Uh, we have another public speaker here, uh, Rumi, Rumiana Grodzanova. Can you please state your name and address for the record? Yes. My name is Rumiana Grodzanova, 220, 186 Street. Hello, everybody, new people, old people. We know each other. Uh, for this, Steve already mentioned for the underground. I just want to know when approximately, not the day, but approximately, when it's going to be starting. For underground in Golden Shores. My question is, when it's going to be approximately? Because that was approved a long time ago. I think that's been asked and answered. Uh, yeah, I think, it's, I think we're going to start, try to start in February of 2022. February. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I was thinking about all this. It's going to be taxpayer money about this committee, advisory. That's uh, not, that's not like responsive to this item. So you want to stay focused on this topic. You're, you're, you're your comment is for item 10H, correct? 
10 H, yes. And uh, what about 10 I? We're not on 10 I, we're on 10 H right now. The same thing's going on. Lately, everybody think what is going on in the city lately. All the meeting, 5, 6, 3, 10 a.m. 5 o'clock, nobody can be. But you wanted that. Thank you for your thank you thank you for your comments, Jerry Jerry Joseph. Uh, we have another comment, another speaker for item 10H. State your name and address for the record, please. Jerry Joseph, 18560 North Bay Road. Um, I understand that there are sidewalks, and um, when the uh, on the completion of this project, there would be. Um, new uh, roadways paved um, according to uh, the uh, concrete and uh, asphalt that's used in the state of Pennsylvania. They currently use pervious asphalt and pervious concrete on their streets and roads, which um, alleviates flooding, which is a big, um, would be uh, quite um, advantageous to us here. We have a lot of flooding on, uh, in Golden Shores, and adding per, uh, impervious concrete would only uh, exacerbate that issue. And we have a, also a problem with the swales in Golden Shores that uh, are required. And um, if we were to use uh, pervious asphalt, that would alleviate that issue. We wouldn't have to have the, um, the rise in the middle of the roadway. We could have actually uh, flat roadways to uh, increase the absorption of the water. And that would absolutely alleviate a lot of the flooding that we have now. Dan, that's uh, something that I wanted to speak to you about uh, tomorrow as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No other comments? Any comments from the commission? Are we take a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I would just like to say um, that we do have on our website a Golden Shores undergrounding street lighting project update page, and mm -hmm. we do have the door hangers. So we will be notifying everybody as, you know, well in advance. Um, and Steve, if you'd like, I can share information directly with you that you can share with your community as things develop. Okay. Thank you. That's very okay. useful. 10I is a resolution ratifying a consulting agreement with Lynn M. Danheiser LLC for the implementation of the cultural master plan. Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the commission, this item is presented to you for ratification. Ratification in this case, meaning in after the fact approval. This item was approved under a prior administration during emergency authorization powers afforded to the city manager regarding uh, purchasing and the ability to enter into contracts. This item was brought to me by our finance department who indicated that there had never been given ultimate authority and approval by the city commission. For procedural and auditing purposes, this open-ended item now needs to be closed via commission approval. And my conversations with the city attorney explained that he had asked that this item be brought before you in the past, and we need to bring it before you now for approval. This contract was a mutually agreed upon termination as of December 3rd, uh, 2021. This is not an ongoing contract. So we've paid this vendor currently 38,990.78 for the months of May through September. There's a balance due of 12,251.92 for the months of October and November for a grand total of 51,242.70. So we're presenting it to you and asking you for ratification in order to close the loop 
from the procedural and finance purposes. Any comments? We do have a public speaker for this one. Rumiana Gross. So we have any comments from the commission? So just for the record, when we, when the city decides to go into contract with any kind of vendor or consultant, it needs to go in front of the commission if it's what amount, 50,000? In excess of $50,000, it has to come to you for approval. So basically, this is to clear the after the fact issue, right? To make it compliant to, for finance. Correct, yes. And the, the, the consultant already resigned. So the way this plays out is we approve. Vice Mayor, could you speak into the I'm microphone? sorry. So the consultant already resigned. So we approve this contract so that it makes it OK that she's already been paid the 30. And it makes it OK that we pay her the work that she's already worked up until this point. And then, because she's already resigned, do we then have to come back and terminate the contract? Or do you do that? No, Does it happen we, as a matter of law? We've done that administratively be, be upon receipt of the resignation letter. So there's no need for it to come back to you. OK. And approving this would, would allow us, as a city, that we're basically cleaning it up and making us compliant with Correct. In, with your in, code. In the event of an audit or, or, well, we will be audited. We get audited. We're going, up, we're going through we're one going right through now. It now. So this is to, so that we, we have all our items checked off on the audit. Um, and. Correct. But we agree that this should have been, this should have been before us before. Yes, it should have been. Okay. And then we're going to clean it up now. Okay. Okay. Do I have a motion? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 10 J is a resolution. That, I'm sorry, that item has been it's deferred. It's been deferred. We're on to discussion items 12A beautification of causeways. Okay. Among the many initiatives which are presented for the commission for discussion for this evening, the beautification of our causeways and specifically the underline of our two causeway overpass bridges, the Bill Lehman Causeway to the north and 163rd Street, the 826 East stand out. While these, these underlines are slated for repainting in, in a standard fashion, we now have an opportunity instead to enhance the aesthetic of these causeways and these underlines, and in doing so, the visceral appeal with a, with a, a special aesthetic imprint. So I'd like to yield uh, this discussion and the presentation to our uh, chair of our Public Arts Committee, our PAC, Javier Rabinovich. Thank you so much. Hi, good evening, Javier Rabinovich, 19111 Collins Avenue. Sunny Hills Beach, Florida. Good evening, Commissioner, Mayor, and City Manager. I'm here today with Jordana. She's a, a curator, art curator, very recognized in the city of Miami and worldwide. And together with her, with her we're going to show you an idea to move forward, an idea that we agree already in the concept with a pack more than a year ago that we're gonna present to you today. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jordana, um, Jordana Skandanin. So um, as you have already mentioned, Mayor, um, there is the, the time has come to paint the uh, overpasses. And I thought um, to present this in a way where you, where it would 
bring an international botanical aspect to it and uh, beautify the, uh, the city of uh, Sunny Isles. So if we can move forward. Um, I've proposed the two, uh, two artists. Uh, one is actually, both are uh, international well-renowned artists. Um, I don't know how it goes. Of course, this is the beginning stages um, and the concept, what you will see is definitely not the actual concept that would be applied to the overpasses. If you decide to proceed with it, we would go to the concept stages where each artist would then um, customize based on, the, based on the design and the square footage of each overpass, they would propose two uh, commission pieces, uh, whichever artist you, you choose, or we can do two, uh, different ones as well. Um, based on that, so the target area would be the overpass, A26. Yeah. Obviously, the idea is to bring the, these artist proposals to the art committee in order to discuss which is the best way and how we're gonna move forward, but we need from the commissioners the, the approval to continue with the initiative. All right, so the target area overpass 826, uh, target area two, 856, um, everything would be hand painted. And then the target area three would be the various utility boxes along Collins Avenue. Obviously that would go hand in hand with the botanical um, aspect as you already have, you do have some of the um, nat natural aspects of it through Collins Avenue. I think it would be a really nice addition based on the architecture and um, the scope of the, of the whole, uh, whole design. So keep moving. The um, one of the artists proposed would be Pixel Pancho. Actually, um, he's an Italian uh, well-renowned um, artist also has a studio here in um, Homestead, so he's very environmentally conscious and um, has a farm as well as a, a studio. Um, his concentration is uh, basically uh, machinery and kind of the sym symphony between technology and, um, and uh, nature. So with the, me uh, with the metal aspects of the overpasses, it would be a nice balance if you can move, if you can move to the, um, this is some of the uh, projects I've actually done with him. This was in Dallas. Um, that was completed about two years ago. So a very large scale um, capabilities. So an overpass would be something very easy for him to do. Um, this is some of just um, the intricate works. Uh, we, we are interested on in his art because the botanical aspect is totally aligned with what we, uh, with one of the elements that we define for the image of the city, and uh, he he does very good all the the leaves and the plants. Also, we are not pursuing the idea to bring faces, hands. Uh, other kind of elements, and also he's willing to work with us to make this more uh, line, liner, or more uh, softer. Of course, based on the based on the the tar targeted areas, he would, uh, if you decide to move forward with this, he would propose the actual uh, 3D rendering of the actual design. So this is just kind of the examples of his work. Uh, the other one would be um, Adfuel, Diago Machado, uh, actually from Portugal. Um, his works um, have been seen all over the world again. Um, and the fact that you have a very international city as well, it would be a nice way. So he um, intersects between Portuguese um, historical tiles and brings in the, the subject within the tiles. So this would be a more architectural uh, form of the um, of the artwork, um, and based on the subject or the theme, he creates the theme within the um, within the tile work. 
So, for example, this one was done in Finland, the other one was uh, done in Portugal, just based on, based on the theme, which is the botanical theme, we would propose the appropriate design. The greening of Sunny Isles Beach. Yes. Thank you. It's great to really elevate some aesthetic, some real visceral. Thank you. To, to, our, to our underpass, our bridges underneath. And when it comes to anything, um, when, it, when it comes to the city rules or however, I'm not very familiar in that, but if you already have a budget set for the painting, I th there would be such an amazing, this is an amazing opportunity where you could actually have a piece of art, not just a regular painted job for the overpass. So this would be where the blue-gray, that whole blue-gray, Susan, that whole blue-gray strip is? Yeah, if you put the picture again. And then the under, and then the columns the underneath. Columns, exactly. And this uh, paint is, is actually sealed, or it's um, so that uh, it lasts? The, the, yeah, the way it works is, uh, depending, each, each artist uses different types of paint. Some of them use uh, acrylic, some use spray paint. But after the painting is done, uh, there is a, a UV protection coat that it's always done in a, in a kind of um, on concrete or metal, depending on that. So that would be, it would last. And um, there is also uh, the UV protection and the, the coating would allow it, uh, in case there were graffiti, people would graffiti it, it would be easier to clean it up without destroying the artwork. I have I done many, sorry, I have done many projects with Goldman Global Arts and uh, the Winwood Group and the Goldman, so throughout the country, and uh, would love to kind of continue with Sunny Isles too. It's okay. great, it's a great theme, the botanical theme. It's a really great theme and it's consistent with some of the objectives of I think this would be amazing for a city I think it would really just take us to another level and turn us into an art destination city as well yes. you know it would really elevate us and it just also bridges a little bit of maybe the purpose of what the pack was supposed to you know and complete I think, it uh, not that I think but also I know based on uh, working with many clients, you do have a large, uh, I would say, not large, but uh, m many collectors here in your city that would really appreciate that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you guys consider uh, local artists, people from the community? Yes. Uh, and also, um, we, I would like to see a, really, I would like to see a 3D rendering of a more, I saw the places where, the, where it would come. 3D, with the 3D rendering, um, and that the way it usually works in the art world is that the artist um, needs the engagement fee, so. <laughs> so Maybe it, we it, can <laughs> approve that first, you know, a fee for a 3D rendering. Yes, yeah. So we can also have an idea, course, you know, like it, vague idea, of course. Uh, they will of course. give us the final one once they're doing it. Yes but just to have an idea of what they would like to we, we present gonna, to us. We're going to ask the artists to present a couple of options that we're going to discuss in the pack, and later we're going to bring to the commissioner meeting again. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're obviously not Winwood, but, you know, no, something no, that's... <laughs> no, <laughs> no, something a little elevated, a little course. a botanical theme is really, it's I think, a great, really totally, great concept. Totally botanical, all a palette Beautiful. of greens. Was a, the, the idea is to include the structures into the landscaping. Thank you so much. We're really excited. Yeah, we'll love to see something. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yes. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, we have some public speakers. We have a couple. Ari Steiger for this item for 12A. This is for this item, correct? I yes? think that we're going to need public statements from the PAC regarding this <clears throat> this uh, resolution or whatever. And as I know, in the city of Netanya, which is the sister city of Sunny Isles, 
they have those, and there's nothing but graffiti on top of it everywhere. They have those electric boxes and the AT&T boxes, whatever they are. The overpasses, there's graffiti that they cannot get rid of it. Once they paint it, next week, again, they have graffiti on top of it. I don't think we have any graffiti in the, in the city, and we don't need any graffiti coming. Okay. Jerry Joseph? Hello, Jerry Joseph, 18560 North Bay Road. I was um, questioning, does anyone have an idea what this um, rendering, you know, this, this proposal might cost? We we did get some we 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 did get some quotes. So again, we're we're in the pro we're in the process of of painting the underline right now, right? We were in the. You mean painting it gray? Just blue gray. For maintenance. for maintenance. I think F dot is doing some work right now, but right. this is a new concept. So mm -hmm. right now, it's open for you all to discuss and then give us right. some direction on coming back. I don't, right. I don't, so there's not a, a set park? budget. Right. I was just trying to understand what a ballpark might be for a project like this. Um, Javier, you have a, you have, you've already. Um, so I want to say first, uh, as a statement, that the Public Art Trust Fund has $900,000 in, in, in the bank account. So we have our uh, trust uh, account fund to use for this job. Now this is city money? Is this for the art trust fund? Yes. I've from the city. Yeah, from the city, correct. OK, now has anyone um, uh, asked around if there are local artists that might for free, display their art, and, and to do this, to work with you to do this. Can we ask? Can we ask that you speak into the mic yes. and then you know Correct. go through the mayor, yes. and then she'll so, so that we because we're recording it. Thank yes. you. Yes, thank you. So I was wondering if anyone has thought that uh, a proposal might be put out for a local artist who might want to work with the city to display their work for free and work on a project such as this, you might have a lot of people that are willing to do this just to have their art displayed, you know, the final project. So for me, I'm, I don't know, I don't know too many people who are gonna do it for free, but putting that aside, um, I think the idea is to get a high quality commissioned artist who, you know, who has some experience and some portfolio and who has some, can give a, you know, a, a vision and some, some perspective. Well, but you don't I mean, know you're unless not gonna, you ask. I don't you know, know Julie, you Julia, do you, what do you think? Will you do it for free? <laughs> Will you take your paintbrush okay. out there? Okay. No. <laughs> get a school project. <laughs> I mean, it's not a school project, but as I see it. But again, you know, I'm one of five, so um, I don't know. It's not a, to me. It's not a sixth grade project. It's I didn't. I wasn't talking about sixth grade project. I think that's um, you know diminishing what I was talking about. Well, you're asking if somebody's going to do it for free. If if you think there that somebody's going to paint the entire underline of the Bill Lehman Bridge and all the transformer boxes and the entire underline of 826 Causeway, I'd love to know who that person is, but who would do all that work for free. But putting that aside, you know, ho hopefully we'll have a unified or uniform aesthetic or vision. So or actually, art, art, art quality for this. I mean, I, th I think that's, in some ways, that's the, that's the beauty and the, the merit and the value of the pack that we, as a respected body, the commissioners, we don't have that, we don't have that aesthetic or that experience or that knowledge ab about art. That's why we, that's why we've always, why we've had a pack and why it's been successful, to, to help, to help vet and make those make those decisions or, you know, have that input. So when uh, the discussion was made uh, regarding the artwork in the uh, in City Hall that uh, that makes all that noise that no one is happy about, 
are you familiar with what I'm talking about? No. On, on the wall, the click, click, click. Oh, you mean that? Um... <laughs> yes. How much was that? Eighty thousand dollars? I don't believe it was eighty thousand, but. How much was it? Maybe. High I'm or sorry. Maybe we're maybe sixty thousand, something like that. We're going. And, we're we're going beyond okay. the scope well, of this no, particular just, item, but. No, because I. The point I'm getting at is for something like that that I had opposed, we could have had local artists displaying their work every month for free just to have their work out there as opposed to spending 60 or 70,000 on a piece of art that even your employees that sit in the city hall can't live with the noise. Okay, well, we're, we're really focused on this uh, botanical and underlined concept. We're not focused well, on what's in the front. Debacle. So I'm just trying to put it out there. Um, before I don't happens. view it as a debacle, but you're certainly entitled to your, your okay. opinion. But thank you. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Do we have any, no other public speakers? So again, this is a discussion item. I think it's a... It's timely and um, happy to see some, some bringing some uh, aesthetic to the, to the city in our public spaces. I have to say that I love the, both, the botanical theme. It really aligns with being a green city and many municipalities have their own themes. So this would be a great opportunity for us. So Mayor, your direction to staff is to, to explore these to explore opportunities the, with yes, the pack and absolutely. bring something back to you? Absolutely. Bring back some proposal or, or renderings or budget and, and so forth, some, some additional. Next step, I'm going to need to bring a scope of work with a budget in order to get the approval and move forward. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we had one speaker card, but I it's Jody Joseph. Is that did you were you looking to speak on this item or that's for something else? Because we're we, okay. Well then, we'll you could speak on the other item because we're we're about to unless. Um, okay, go ahead. But again, we're we're clear. We have a clear direction um, to to bring back to bring back the proposal and you know artists and scope of work and budget. Right, we we have a clear directive. Okay. Jody State Joseph, your name. 185 Address? 60 North Bay Road. Okay. Um, I'm just a little confused as to $800,000 budget, but we don't know how much of that money we're going to be charged for the artwork. And I'm just wondering, I know we had a similar discussion about the um, Aquilina where they made a mistake and stamped off the work too quickly. And now it's a mandatory garage. It must be built. It's going to be 10 stories. And it was pretty much the same discussion that it's going to be beautiful with jewels and green and greenery, but no matter what, it's still a garage. Um, there are so many other areas. For instance, do we know who painted um, the artwork, the mural in Hallandale? Does anybody know that? Did we find out what that price was? Just to be fair and shop around. I mean, instead of just, you know, fixated on one company. And I'm just curious, is this the same company that did the uh, Winterfest? Did they have something to do with the Winterfest? No. I don't I know. Jody. We do something immediate. We had like no time to make up our mind on that with the millions that that, that had cost. But I'm just saying it's beautiful. We all love artwork. But um, there's nothing wrong with getting different bids. And some people may be willing to not charge just to have their artwork displayed. And as we speak about in the city, there's some incredibly talented people. So to downplay that now is kind of a contradiction. So I just think it's fair if we could get beautiful artwork at half the price, why not? So that's just um, a suggestion I have. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we're moving on to item 12B. Yes, 12B is a discussion regarding advisory committees by Vice Mayor Viscar. So we already had a, a, a item. 
the commission if there were um, other committees that may, perhaps you have been thinking about or, or if there's other topics that, um, that you would like to consider. Um, myself, I, um, I, I, I had two that I was thinking about. Um, one of them is if and when we get a, a team space, I'd like to see a, like a, a, maybe some high schoolers or some, maybe our school government kids have like a teen advisory uh, mm, board to kind of get their, their input, what would they like to see in that space. But of course, that's, that's down the road. That, um, but I'd like to see something like that, starting to, to foster that uh, civic engagement uh, of the young, the young people. Uh, and, um, and I was also thinking about uh, possibly having a, like a, a legislative advocacy committee allow, allowing residents and, and modeling for them or assisting them in, in supporting legislation or maybe giving them summaries of things along the lines, Alex, of what, what you do for us when you go to the, the, the legal cities and you bring us back those summaries and we say, oh, we support it or you should support it, but then maybe it stays there for a lot of us and maybe we can help the, um, the community in, in actively supporting legislation that would impact us in this city, you know, our issues. Vice Mayor, could you just grab your microphone, please? Of course, and I, my mic is off, of course. So, so those were ideas that I that I have: the the um, a teen advisory and the um, like, a legislative advocacy or some version of that. And I, I thought maybe you guys would have ideas too, and we can discuss so that down the road uh, we can bring those either as different advisory committees or something else, perhaps a fact-finding um, issue, so that it's not advisory. So I, I give you the floor. No, I, I like those two. I think yeah. the teen one, uh, you know, it's needed, especially, you know, we're thinking down the road of creating some sort of teen center. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the one for legislative, let's say, advocacy will be good. Uh, I would add something, you know, that, you know, for the elderly, perhaps, you know, I do get a lot of calls and they need help with different subjects. Um, I still don't have a clear idea. Um, you know, perhaps we could help them with different issues in their condos or, you know, different issues uh, pertaining to, you know, um, I don't know, anything that has to do with, with whatever they, we could help them with regarding city issues or state or county issues. Perhaps some have some people that could perhaps help them and talk to them and guide them because a lot of times I feel like they just don't know how to who to who to go to they don't have resources they don't know what number to call so I think that will be something to 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 help you know if we could just help them out that way uh, and maybe instead good, of committing yeah. some of these things can be addressed through through a workshop forum maybe it's not perhaps, committee yeah, material yeah, but we yeah. can we can open up maybe create a um, yeah yeah, a dialogue in, in terms of workshops. And, and even to discuss, you know, certain things, you know, like some, some events perhaps, they could give us some feedback. I know we have the, uh, the senior center, but perhaps they could give us some, some feedback on, on what they would like to see. And uh, even with the committee, how we could help them with different issues that they face uh, at that age, you know. So I think that'll be good. I mean, they have, um, there, there was a, so there's sure. an ombudsman kind of for the elderly, I think that's at the state level, or they had that in the past, but that's a little yeah, different from a committee that actually does fact finding or makes recommendations. It's more of a staff or, or workshop. I don't know that that fits neatly into a, a committee format, so to speak. Like, yeah, what is I, it, I a committee on the clear, elderly, or I'm not sure what they're, you know, what their portfolio i mean yeah i'm not sure i'll find out i think it's more like to if they're having if there's elderly abuse or, or things of that right nature. so they have From i think right level, they have an elder abuse hotline and i think do, there's an do. ombudsman but for the elderly that, no i was thinking more like everyday type of issues maybe mm -hmm. they have i don't know issues they don't know how to their building's not communicating with them or they they just need help with you know getting transportation and they don't know that the county could probably supply that. So th that type of help, okay. you know, very simple things that for them, you know, they, they just sometimes they don't know who to go to. So 
Yeah, like no, I still don't have it clear, but I think that, you know, some something that's that why it's a discussion. Like, yeah. like yeah. Aging, why, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. aging with dignity program, something that yeah. they can call Someone and they have resources. Say, I have this issue. Do you know who I could call? And, and for us, it's probably just going on Google and, and giving them the number, but for them, it's, it's just difficult. So, yeah. Yes. And the thing one is amazing. Yeah. I, I that really is, like that. Yeah. I mean, I and got, with yeah. teenagers from the high school where they get together and say like what are they what they want how they get it etc i love it because well, yeah. we have we obviously we have the school here but uh, we we have high schoolers and you know it'd be nice to to uh, engage them as well and and you know help them transition into into uh, responsible adults we had had that um, one of the ideas was like a teen green i don't know mm -hmm. if that intersects with sustainability but something like a teen Teen ambassadors or Teen Green and some of the some of the initiatives that the teens. But I think that's a great. I like that a lot. I think that could be a really robust. Down uh, the road, I think it would be. I mean, format. something to keep our eye on. Absolutely, it's something that would be extremely beneficial. Extremely beneficial. Okay. Great. Okay. Any other comments? Thank you, Vice Mayor. You're welcome. Next item, 12C. 12C is a discussion item regarding a space needs assessment. So that's also me. I don't have a report to give, but I wanted to uh, see if we can get an update on, uh, we, we requested a feasibility study. We kind of touched on it earlier tonight regarding you know what we would do with these spaces, where if anywhere we could put a new police station or what's the best way to deal with that and it was supposed to go out to bid this was what like back in june yes yeah, so the update is we received three bids as of november 30th 2021 so currently the staff is reviewing those bids and we expect to bring something back to you in january for your consideration okay Discussing the the um, the other the space the Navarro space or not at this point. We we can the if you like of, not the Navarro the other the other portion. The Turnberry. Uh, no, not yet. That, I don't think that's a commission issue. I think it's administrative. When we come back to discuss the feasibility, we'll also have make it part of a larger discussion because some of you have asked me for a list of city-owned properties, so I'll make that a combo discussion at that time. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. Are we any other? No, that's okay. That's all. Great. Okay. Uh, next item: twelve C. Twelve D, Mayor, um, 12 and that's D. a discussion regarding an ordinance to ban. Balloon releases. Bye. Okay. I would like to start. I would like to start by reminding everyone that Sunny Isles Beach is an eco-committed city, and this is something that we should be proud of. I know I am. This city campaign is based on promoting and fostering eco-friendly and eco-driven adjustments that everyone can make in their daily lives to help save our local environment and the planet. As beautiful as it may seem to honor someone or to host an event with an intentional balloon re release, we must understand that this act poses a real threat to our wildlife, marine life, and our environment. What goes up must come down somewhere. Let's continue our path to being eco-committed and use our media department to educate and bring awareness to negative impact of balloon releases. Let's be part of the solution just like many other municipalities who have introduced ordinances banning intentional balloon releases. Let's partner with organizations like the Miami-Dade Sea Turtles and the Pelican Harbor Seabird Station and invite them to our city with the purpose of educating us all and how we can be better stewards to our environment and in making our home safer for everyone, including our sea turtles and marine life. It's just a step on the right direction. Along. Does the county have it in place already? Do we know? I, there's I don't know why I thought we already had 
there's state there's a state law in several municipalities although none abutting us uh, have hollywood has one i know for a fact okay. um, the county doesn't have one uh don't well know. i mean it doesn't matter. i don't think so I mean, it's it's it, it doesn't matter we can even if we do one we can do belt and suspenders but i don't know why i thought we already had it yeah the the issue though is that all of those are doing as uh, criminal offenses and so we'd have to pay for prosecution of a violation of this code it wouldn't be code enforcement it would be um, criminal violation I think that for my purposes of introducing it it's more on an educational basis and again it's about being eco-committed, having the conversation, mm -hmm. teaching our children, bringing in all of these organizations that are already working within mm -hmm. our city and our county, and um, being part of that solution basis. So is there direction then? Are we, we going to want to see what this ordinance would look like, or can we do an ordinance? The will of the commission, what would you like us to draft? Okay. Correct. There are ordinances from other municipalities. Okay, so your direction is for us to bring you back an ordinance um, of some type in January. Okay. Thank you. Right. Not only is it the latex, the plastic, it's the string. Yeah. You know, this is, it's, it's common sense. We need to really just acknowledge it and, and be a leader also. Okay. okay. We will Good. do it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next item, um, 12E, add-on, crosswalk. Okay. I have added the discussion item regarding the crosswalk at 189th Street and Collins Avenue after one of our residents posted it in one of the Sunny Isles Beach Facebook groups. First of all, I would like to thank all of the res residents who have relentlessly, relentlessly advocated for pedestrian safety. As a resident and newly appointed commissioner, I share the same frustration and wanted to make this one one of the first issues I introduced for discussion with fellow commissioners. Due to inaction in the past, our pedestrian safety issue has become complex and multi-leveled. We must have detailed conversations if we are to implement real effective solutions to improve safety. I am committed to ensure we have the focused conversations we need on this issue at the municipal level to ensure we implement effective solutions to improve safety. I hope we can have a productive dialogue and look forward to hearing from each one of my colleagues as I know we are all committed to improving public pedestrian street safety for our residents. Aside from addressing this specific crosswalk with our city manager, I have requested we follow up with our police department to assure we increase police presence. That we continue to work with FDOT to ensure that we stay on schedule in delivering the traffic signal. And that we direct our media department to help educate and bring awareness to our community on our traffic laws and danger zones. I'd like to invite our chief of police. Good evening. Well, first and foremost, I want to clarify that the crosswalk that we're talking about in question is 189th Street and Collins Avenue. And the police department and the city alike totally agree that that intersection is dangerous, that crosswalk. We're not denying that. It was opposed three years ago when DOT put it in. Um, at this point, I know it's been in the city manager's office for several years working on this to come up with a resolution to it. I think we're getting close to it now, and I know the residents that have been bringing it to our attention, they've been, they've been advocates for probably the last year strongly on this same issue. Um, we've gone out there trying to find the best way we can keep the residents safe until we come up with this resolution. It's dangerous, it is dangerous. We had our motor units out there trying to figure out a way we can try to enforce some of the rules and laws out there. It's dangerous for them as well as it is for the residents crossing. Um, Sergeant Javier Estes, as you guys met this morning, or this afternoon, <laughs> um, he's gone out there recently and did his own study and trying to figure out a way we can make it sa as safe as possible until they come up with this resolution. And I'll let him speak on that in a minute. It's a, it's a little detour of a walk, but it avoids that dangerous intersection. Um, 
We did, I believe Susan Simpson made contact with the consultant that's handling this for us, and they did confirm that the mast arm is what we're waiting for to be able to put traffic lights up there. It is on order, it's been on order, but because like everything else, everything's taken forever. But they did confirm that they anticipate the delivery of this mast arm sometime in March for an installation in the beginning of April. Um, I know, again, the resident that we're referring to, that she's also been in contact with DOT, and they confirmed with her also that they're going to be installing it in April. So I think we're getting close, but and I'll let Sergeant Estes explain the option to the crosswalk right now that might hopefully take a little bit of the danger away. Good evening again. Um, the option that he's referring to, uh, basically what I did was I went over there, surveyed everything, and in order, I guess, to mitigate uh, the problem that we have there, that we've been, if you really look at it, if it was my family, I wouldn't cross the street there. Um, it's very dangerous. There's, it's, it's unique in a way because we have a lot of people that come through the city that live here that take that same path. Uh, they're used to getting on the layman, and it almost like invites you to speed up as you get on the layman. So there's no light there northbound. When you look at the southbound side, it's real safe. It's the other world. So you have one world on this side that it's kind of a disaster, and uh, one world on the other side, southbound, which is what we're hoping to get on the north end. What I did was I stood on the east side, walked north towards Ocean 2, and there's an area there you can cross. And then I went around and just walked down the sidewalk. It took me six minutes and 20-some seconds uh, versus 30 seconds just going across. I mean, it, it, it's just it's the safest way to do it if you're going to go anywhere north, if you're coming that way. Um, that being said, as I was out there and I crossed the way it's in, intended by FDOT, uh, where they put the crosswalks, I had a car slam on its brakes, and I was wearing the full uniform, my boots, and everything. I mean, you know, I had a car slam on its brakes. Uh, all the cars ended up stopping, but it, it's difficult even with the, the state statute. When you read the state statute, it's the pedestrian walkway statute. It's 316, 130, and the subsection that goes to subsection, sub, subsection 7. Uh, and the state statute clearly states the pedestrian has to be in the walkway in order to enforce it. So to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, that's more geared towards uh, crosswalks. For example, when we're leaving here, we go to 183rd, uh, make a right and then a left to go north on Collins. The way it's written in the statute, if the pedestrian is in the crosswalk and has already entered the crosswalk, there's a section that says once they're on the half where the cars are traveling, the cars need to stop. In this case, the pedestrians are there and they're pressing the button for the lights and the misconception comes where they think the cars are going to stop with yellow or amber lights, as they call it, for the state. According to state law, and I, I have that there, and I can give you the, sub, the subsection and everything for it, red lights, stop, yellow light, caution. Uh, in order for that to, to get cars to stop, it has to be red. I can't write a ticket or we can't write a ticket to someone who goes through the yellow. I basically have to wait for someone to be in the crosswalk. And it sounds terrible but it's just a reality. Uh, the way it would work, in theory, the best way, one vehicle stops to let the pedestrian enter the crosswalk, then when the other vehicle takes that lane and goes, I can stop and cite that vehicle according to the way the state law is written. So we use it a lot. We're familiar with it from when we do our pedestrian enforcement details. It's just, it doesn't give the pedestrian the opportunity to enter the crosswalk safely. And they have the false sense that those lights are going to get the cars to stop, and they don't. So in theory, if you're a pedestrian, you're pressing the light, and a car keeps going through, and there's no one in the crosswalk, I can't stop inside it based on the way the law is written. There's a lot of ambiguity in that law. And like he said, and, and he was telling you before, going around, and what, once we get that red light there, it's going to make all the difference in the world. But for right now, it's just it's very difficult. I just wanted you guys to understand what we do, what, what, why we can and can't in certain you guys have any questions for me or anything? So um, I w was approached by a resident this past weekend that said in Washington, D.C., they have not red light cameras, but speeding cameras. And I guess they're legal there. And I'm under the impression that you, it's not, it's not, there's a proposed bill to make those illegal in, in school zones, but I, it's not the law. So we don't, 
in Florida, we don't have the right to install speeding cameras, basically where you position cameras and they can catch you for speeding. And As of right now, I, Florida, I've, right? Never, I've never heard of that. I've seen them. I've seen them in Europe, to be quite in honest. see they have them all over, according to this resident. Why can't we get them here? And I, I just don't know that there's any legal precedent for that. Yeah, it, correct. It'd have to come from the state. The state will have to approve it. And then we can only enforce what the state says we can approve. But, I mean, it's a great idea. I've seen it in Europe. And it's funny. You'll be driving down the expressway in Europe, and then everybody slows down. And you're like, why are they slow down? Oh, there's cameras ahead. It's, it's just, you know, it's not. It's a great idea, but again, the state would have to pass it. Because that would be a perfect location for a, a speeding. A speeding Even the speeding, a, a car going 40 miles an hour hits someone. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we lived it last year, unfortunately. And, and speed's not, I, I, it, you, a lot of you see me on the Layman Causeway. We, we, we park there, and people are like, oh, it's real dangerous. It's the best place for us to get people speeding. They can't really see us, so they anticipate all the time that we're there, especially in the morning hours. Um, and we can also watch that pedestrian walkway if they violate somebody's right away. Um, believe it or not, when, as they're getting to the bottom of the causeway, as they're coming up the ramp, the majority, car, the majority of cars really aren't going that fast. But it, we just need people to stop so people can cross the street. And I think with the way that's set up now from FDOT, it's just not safe. I think that's very telling, and it's important that we communicate that and, and bring that awareness to our community so that way they know, because they are under that false sense of you know, security, safety, that once they press it and the lights are going off, that they can walk into, you know, onto, onto the street. Right. And the and reality is- the same is, thing at 163rd, I mean, mm, even you read that my was, mind. that's a blind corner. You read my mind. You, if, and and yeah. under, again, we have a lot of, of people who come here from other countries. Exactly. There's, we'll see a car make a U-turn on a red light. And I'll tell you, that's probably 80% of those people are Colombian. Nothing against Colombian people. <laughs> it's legal in Colombia to make a U-turn on a red light. And we stop them and are like, Colombia, and they go, yeah, how did you know? And I'm like, uh, U-turn on a red light. It's just, we, it, there's so many different people that come into the city. And from working on the street, you get to know all, you know, when we used to stop people in, in uh, well, when I used to stop people <laughs> on 172nd and North Bay, they're like, oh, I'm staying at the hotel. And you're like, the hotel? And they're like, yeah, like, oh, you mean intercoastal. It, it, it's just all these different things that you get to learn. And you deal with a lot of people who really don't know the laws here. And the easiest way is red light, stop, let people cross. Yellow lights, what does that mean? How, how, how trafficked is that crosswalk as opposed to some of the other crosswalks? I mean, I know people have advocated for like public service aides or PSAs, crosswalk guards or things, you know, as some sort of a, you know, what makes that crosswalk any, you know, in need of that or any different from any of the other crosswalks? It, it, we, didn't, we didn't have that before at that crosswalk on 189th. Oh, yeah. That's not, that's relative. When, when, do you remember when it went up? Yeah, we, ne we never had that. So before that, and I mean, I've been on motors here for a long time. I deal with a lot of traffic issues. We never had that before. And then once they put it in, we all kind of just sat there going, wait Why? a second, this isn't going to work. What are you guys Why doing? Why did they put it in there? That's such a dangerous yeah, area. I know exactly. the city was opposed to that, you even implementing that yeah. to go across. You, know, like you, you were saying about the, the service aids. I mean, we, we looked at that. We even looked at taking one of our motormen and dedicating them to putting them there. It, it's just a dangerous intersection. Putting them out there is putting them as much harm's way as the residents. They, I, matter of fact, I was out there for a half hour today. I parked my car there and just watched. And it, it's crazy. And I saw people start to cross and same thing. These cars don't stop. Doesn't, he said he did it in a uniform. They don't realize who he is. They're going to run him over just as quick. They don't. It's, it's I don't want to say human nature, but when you're driving and you're about to enter a highway, first thing you think is that you're doing south because you're, yeah. you're going to get onto a highway. So these people are trained to go faster. And they, they don't know, I mean, the lights are flashing on two sides, off to the side. There's Good nothing end. across the street, that little extra, it's nothing, it's just two signs that light up and don't tell people to stop. Chief, so, but, yeah. but the only solution or tool that we have right now is enforcement. Because like you said, the project is gonna be March, April next year. So the only thing we can, that we have right now in our hands is you guys. 
So is you guys the only ones that can help us, like overnight? Because the other solution is going to be over time. No, I, I, I completely agree, and and we're not. I don't want. I don't want you to think I'm telling you. Oh, we're not going to enforce it. That's not what I'm saying at all. I want you to understand when I'm sitting on the motorcycle and I'm waiting. It's like a stop sign. I got to wait for you to run the stop sign to write you a stop sign ticket. Right. The red light. I got to wait for you to take a red light to write your red light ticket. Unfortunately, with this. I have to wait till a pedestrian is in the crosswalk, whether it's a foot or whatever, for me to write that car. This isn't when you're leaving 183rd, going back to my previous point, you're coming from a standstill and starting to turn left. What speed could your car be traveling at? Okay. This is from a car that's coming at 35, 40, 45 mm -hmm. miles an hour. Okay. And you want them to stop for, it's just, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't make yeah, sense. Exactly. And I want you to know, I would, any, being a motorman, we write tickets. That's our livelihood. I have it in my head when I leave. Oh, I gotta write tickets. I gotta, you know, it's just the way we're programmed. If that, uh, if that uh, particular intersection gave us yielded X number of tickets, my guys would be out there all day. It's just it really the way it's written. And and what will happen is, you know, we have uh, some attorneys up here. We go to court. Your Honor, what does the the, the Law say, well, they have to be in the intersection. Officer, was a person in the intersection? No, they ran the yellow light. Case dismissed. Case thrown out. I mean, I want you to understand why it is that we do. The, the speed limit on the top is 15. The right? speed limit on the top, on our side, it's 45, and then it's 55 in Aventura. No, no, on no, the on the top of the causeway. When you're going to like Aventura. Okay, when you when you're going up on the causeway, you'll see the speed limit sign is also yellow. Correct. And that yellow means that it's a suggested speed from the state. It's so you can negotiate the curve. Okay. But it's 15 or 25? We, right? we write it as 35. The court always looks at it, anything above 35 because the yellow is what F thought is telling you. Anytime you see a sign with a yellow background, not the white, it's the suggested yeah. F thought. So we write, whenever we write a ticket, they're like, if you're going up the ramp and you're going 55, I'll write you 55 and 35. The yellow is what they suggest for you okay. to be able to negotiate that curve. Okay. But I, to, it, that's why you see the sign, but we don't write it under that. We write it under the 35. Okay. So, so what's the feasibility of reconfiguring? You, you talked about reconfiguring that crossing, right? Where it will take people more time, obviously, but that's F dot. So, how, no, no, what's the, the feasibility? We can reconfigure. How, how soon can we reconfigure that? The more time that? is now. You don't huh? have to reconfigure it. It's yeah. there. You, you just walk north to Ocean 2. Yeah. There's a crosswalk there. You hit the button, you cross the two lanes. Okay. How can we get people to follow that? Okay. All right. And then may perhaps put some signage where people are directed to, to cross from there. And that was another I, I don't thing know. was the signage. If yeah. I, again, I don't know the legal parameters that we have to add a sign over there to make it like a deterrent for people to cross. And that's, that's where Maybe F... Right. Cross at your own yeah. risk, right? I mean, it's, it's no, it's, it's, no, it's, it's I mean, just say, no, but it really is. Say, but maybe we should go back to F dot and tell them, you know, maybe this false sense of security and the blinking lights yeah, is is just, is telling them correct. to, yeah. you and, know, and proceed. So maybe. Maybe we should pressure to remove. But again, going back to before we had that, it was never an issue. We didn't so, have it. So we, had to cross this way. so we need to remove it. We need to remove the, the lights. Remove it or get a red light. I mean, I guess they're going to have to. The, the, the red light is going to come in. But in the meantime. Yes. Right. Enforcement. In the meantime, like I said, right now, it's they, they, if right. my kids and my family, and I've told that to one family that lives up there, we had an accident up there. And I said, can I be honest with you? I guess. I wouldn't let my kids cross it. I go, I take a six minute walk. And that's six minutes to go up and back. I mean, I think six minutes. Long time ago, you used to put one police car that was empty, but it was on the, well, the west now, side, right, in the, the westbound, yeah. Right, right, the problem now too is, we've also looked into putting signage there. Um, I have it on, if you go north at about 185th, you'll see one of our uh, electronic signs, message boards. Mm, okay. I can't put it in the apex because if I put it in the apex, I'm blocking that sign. Is this and now the liability falls on us if God forbid something happens. 
So the best place to put it where it wasn't blocking the uh, the blinking lights was at 185th Street where it's at now. And you know, I, I mean, we're trying, but it's just it's so difficult there. Mayor, I, I was just going to say I, I think we've heard the concerns, and I, I think it's important that we discussed it because I wanted. The residents I think the Commissioner wanted the residents to know what action are we taking and I think you can tell by uh, what the police department has told us they've taken the time to physically walk the intersection themselves so from an enforcement perspective that's going to continue we've like Mike said we've been in contact with FDOT as late as this week uh, Susan uh, mentioned to me that the update was it's supposed to be here by March of 2022. But to your point, if we can do more work with media, and meanwhile, we'll do the best that we can regarding the enforcement. But the message is clearly that it is a dangerous intersection, and we're going to do everything we can to try to help keep the residents safe. At some point, would, are we going to? advocate to I mean if, if that red light if put for our mask arm if it's not effective are we going to advocate at some point to I, well, it we'll, should be effective right. it's, it's going to be a red light you think it's going to be effective once we get well, it. well it's going to be a red light in, in the, the Hollandale Beach um, ramp right. when mm -hmm. you're going from Collins on to yeah. Hollandale they have a light that's there a, it's beautiful that's a, that's right a, that's a, yeah excellent exactly right when you're going north and you're going to get Hollandale to go west it's very similar yeah. to what we have. It's yeah. one lane, it's three and, pieces, two, yeah. and then the two lanes on the side. Correct. It's almost identical, yeah. and it works. It's very beautiful. Yeah. So you think the problem will be will will be solved once we get this? Problems are never solved. Uh, it, it'll be better. It'll no, be better. It will help. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have the Not only that, it'll also slow down the cars. Correct. Yeah. Traveling because they know that it's a red light they're coming so it's going to change Correct. so we can't push them any faster that it is what it is it's march april that's what's going to happen yeah, yeah. okay but can yeah. we keep an eye on it because oh, we don't want we march do. to become april and april to become yeah. june and, and, and then june FDOT becomes FDOT december you know so like f needs to know that we really mean business and we want that like yesterday Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. Um, our discussion, next discussion item on proactive community policing. May we had a public Come speaker. On. Oh, okay. Aha, Pavel. Lest we forget, Pavel. Pavel Actually, we have a couple here. Go ahead. Go ahead. 17145 North Bay Road. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor Goldman, Honorable Commissioners, and City Staff. I actually had uh, two comments, but I'll speak first on, on this item on this crosswalk, a very dangerous crosswalk. Um, and uh, I, I have another dimension to this situation as a driver. I often drive up to the crosswalk and I see the light blinking. I see the, uh, the people trying to cross, but they're not crossing because they see the cars coming. They are afraid to put their foot into onto the crosswalk, which is the requirement for, for enforcement, but they're still afraid. I stop and immediately I start looking back into my rear view mirrors and my heart starts skipping. Mm -hmm. Either I see a car coming real fast in the left lane and I, I start thinking to myself, do I swerve to the left to try to protect the pedestrians, put myself in danger and prevent the situation or cause a bigger accident? Or do I just do nothing and hope these people don't, don't cross and see that car coming? Or I see a car, car coming right behind me really fast and I hope that they stop. So I think uh, if, if we cannot do anything more to push for faster red light, which probably would solve the situation, perhaps we can push FDOT, maybe they'll do that faster, come out and remove this thing until a red light can be put in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's just an accident waiting to happen there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jerry Joseph, did you want to speak on this item? S name and address for the record? Yes, Jerry Joseph, 185 60 North Bay Road. I just want to say for the record that I've been working on this um, 189th Street and Collins uh, red light issue since August of this year. Um, prior to uh, the city signing off on 
uh, the contract with FDOT to actually have the uh, mast arm produced. Um, at the time I got involved, uh, uh, the city manager had not signed off. It was just in limbo. I don't know how much longer it would have sat there like that. Um, Stan, did you, uh, were you involved uh, with that project at that time? I was not, oh. but so, I am now. Right, so prior to August of this year, the, uh, the contract for the mast arm had not been signed off by the city. Apparently there was um, a change order that had uh, not been signed and FDOT was waiting for that. Uh, once I had letters back and forth with Stacy Miller and Jennifer Burgos, the two P's at FDOT, um, apparently the city signed what they had to and um, the uh, construction went to the contractor to have the mast arm uh, put into production. Um, I've posted all of my letters and even the current configuration of what will be when the mast arm is installed um, online for anyone to see. And I'll do that again. But um, the, uh, the installation date as of now is March, April of 2022. Um, another idea I had is if anyone's been to uh, near the Apple store at Navatura Mall, they have a crossing guard with whistles that, there, that um, street there is quite active and dangerous. Uh, that's the reason that they do have a crossing guard with a sign and a whistle. And I believe that would be an, a good interim um, you know, stopgap until this light is installed. So you, you might want to consider that as well. Thank you. OK. Um, are we? Item? If there's no other cards, then I believe then we can move to the next item, which is discussion regarding proactive community policing. <laughs> All right. The discussion item regarding proactive community policing is in reference to the bullying and the after school scheduled facts of fights occurring in our city. Sadly enough, for years now, parents have been sending me recorded videos of our school children partaking in violent behavior. It seems that some of our middle school kids are scheduling a meeting at different locations around town to fight and then posting videos of these fights onto social media platform, further spreading and exponentially increasing the damaging impact of these horrific events. As a mother of two young children, it has been painful to watch these videos and alarming to constantly hear about our children getting bullied. It is even more concerning when this behavior becomes violent and viral. I believe we must take every action we can to address this issue to ensure our community is aware of the problem at all levels. I'd like to thank our mayor, Dana Goldman, for the proclamation on National Bullying Awareness Month in October and for inviting our honorable school board member, Lucia Baez Geller. She spoke on behalf of the school board and to further look into result-driven decisions and solutions that will help our children within the school. As a commissioner, I wanted to bring this to, this to the attention of our city, and I hope we can unite everyone behind the common goal to prevent this type of abusive behavior. I believe having this discussion will benefit us all, and I admit I do not have all the solutions, but I do look forward to a discussion amongst my colleagues on the days. And I will share some of the thoughts, ideas, updates, and concerns I have. I'm asking our parents and city to get and remain involved so that we can all collectively do our part to address this issue. This discussion item will hopefully be the beginning of an ongoing community effort with the main purpose of preventing these attacks before ever happening. When possible, we should do everything we can to be there and take action before it happens. I will continue these efforts with the Norman Auto Club K-8 principal and counselor to see how we can best help to support them and our children while in and out outside of the school. School Board Representative Lucia Baez Geller has provided me an update on two important designations within our school. No Place for Hate and Restorative Justice School. I will be joining her on site 
and I invite anybody on the dais to join me as well and her to learn firsthand about the plan set and the action to embed an inclusive environment through teachers, staff, and student training on conflict resolution and in building strong relationships that cultivate and advance equity, support, counseling, and more. I'm looking forward to continuing my conversations with our city manager, assistant city manager, to create an after school safe haven and teen recreational center within our city, which we've spoken about. I also hope to work with our city staff, including Sylvia Flores, and alongside our police department in exploring how we can launch a police youth program, such as Police Explorers. I am confident that as a, as a community, our parents, residents, and fellow government officials will be able to brainstorm, identify, and advance additional solutions so we can do our part in ensuring our children have a safe educational environment so that our next generations may flourish. Let us not forget that it begins at home. It takes a village and we must be the example for our youth. Welcome, any comments? Important topic, important issue, and important for support, our policing and so forth. And these incidents are occurring and they can't be swept under the rug. I have a couple of comments. Um, first of all, our children, especially middle schoolers, are full of energy. Mm -hmm. And our school has not a recess. They have no recess. They are there from 8 in the morning, 8.20, until 3 p.m. without a recess. When I was in school, I had two recess, but long time ago. Is that physical, physical education do they have? No, they have PE, but mm -hmm. not everybody. And now, obviously, not every day. In middle schoolers, they don't have to have PE. You can opt out. So that's, PE was when they had a little bit of opportunity to burn all the excess of energy. Also, right now, because of COVID, they are not also in the cafeteria. Not all the classes can go to the cafeteria, which was another moment where they could socialize. So imagine these kids confined in that building for so many hours, then they come out, uh, we had the issue also of many kids that they don't live here in Sony Isles, so they have to wait for the parents to come pick them up around the city. So it is not only like one issue, but I believe it's a combination of many issues. Also, um, I like the idea of the, I don't know how you call it, but I put in my notes the idea of a cadet program mm -hmm. and bring especially the back kids to that program, so maybe we can turn some bad kids that used to be bad and then into work with you guys in law enforcement, you know? And um, For the record, I was part of the Police Explorers program and <laughs> okay. was not a bad kid, but it, but it was a great <laughs> program and it was a great way of learning discipline, the law, being able to ride with the police officers, being able to be inside of the police station, it gave me a sense of responsibility. Um, it got me inv much more involved within the community. And they really instill such a, a large mentorship program that they are you know, instilling just the qualities and the characteristics for these children to go back into their community and instill that as well there. And my last point, it was about the teen center. We need mm -hmm. some kind of infrastructure for our children, for our teenagers especially. Um, tennis courts, basketball courts, something outdoors, not to put like, they need to be out of the classroom into activities that allow them to socialize, to play, and to burn that excess of energy. Um, we need to think a little bit outside the box, and I've been in contact with staff about that, um, and hopefully, in the near future, we can bring some ideas to discuss here to help our teenagers because it's just mental health. Mm -hmm. You cannot be only about school and the FSA and having good grades for the school to be grade A. They need to run, they need to play. Sometimes they need to fight. <laughs> so you, I have four children, so I'm a little bit used to that. So yeah, we need to do anything to help them, okay. Well, I think, I think Susan and Sylvia both had great programs going on for a while and COVID interrupted that. But mm -hmm. I think we're getting back in the swing of things where their programs are going to start going again. But one of the things the commissioner said was uh, the 
Where our problem is if these parents, they have to police their own kids. They're posting things on social media, and our biggest, our biggest uh, problem is this TikTok. Everyone wants to do TikTok challenges. And a lot of these fights, I and mean, we, we had, um, we went back and searched our records from the start of the school year. We only had one reported incident of a school fight, which was just last Monday. And it was reported. Our, our sergeant went over and immediately notified a school resource officer. They identified the kids right away. Apparently, there's a new uh, assistant principal at the school, and I apologize, I don't know his name, but he supposedly takes a hard stance. And these kids were brought in the same day, identified uh, and suspended from school that quick. <clears throat> so he's not playing around. But we got back to our see something, say something. I mean, that's important. These parents have to police their children and call us. I mean, it's a lot better for their kids to face threats on the Internet or just stupid comments on the Internet than to let them carry out something they're going to do that could be life-changing for them. So, I mean, we need the parents' help on that. I mean, yeah, but again, we, we try to monitor it. And well, Sergeant, please, you come up. He's kind of, he, he's the sergeant oversees the detective bureau. Um, we have counts that we monitor some of these Instagrams and things like that, and I'll let him explain to you. We, I mean, we're not a big department. They don't, we don't have a fusion center that can constantly be on there, but you can explain what you do with the Instagram. Yeah, we do monitor certain locations that are problematic for us, I and mean, just videos of concern or pictures of concern we'll follow up on. And, and quite honestly, we haven't seen these specific videos. We were, we did have the reported incident on Monday. It was followed up on and resolved. Um, but again, it, we just need the community to come and, and make us aware, right? Mm -hmm. So we can respond, we respond quickly and effectively. So it would help us out a great deal. Yeah, I agree. You know what? I, I do receive so many videos, and the children know about this because they're getting scheduled. It's, 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 a, it's a scheduled event, so the children are showing up to see the fighting. Um, and part that's why I think that Stan came up with this community, you know, proactive policing, because it really has to be about the community and everyone, you know, working together. If you see something, you have to say something, and we need to work together. Right. I think in my in my discussions with the commissioner, I, I also spoke to uh, the chief. If there's a way that our media department can assist them with some of these things that are getting posted online, I think to your point, uh, a lot of what happens with this is it's not getting reported mm -hmm. through the police department. It's being done more for social media. Mm -hmm. So I think if we take a little more more proactive re, uh, approach on the media side then we can uh, notify the police and work directly with them and kind of approach it from a different perspective. So, so just to understand, so there, there's a school police uh, resource officer and um, I, I just want to understand how you work with, with that resource officer and um, I wanted to know if we, you said we monitor, but I wasn't sure, if, are, are we monitoring uh, social media accounts we where also, a lot of these, I mean, to be honest with you guys, we have fictitious accounts that we've used for numerous investigations that okay. for years and years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've we've had cases from, you know, gun cases, home invasion robberies mm -hmm. to kids fighting, right? It's just mm -hmm. what we see out there. You know, we try to take a proactive role where, you know, we'll notice some sort of criminal activity online and we respond the best we can. So, again, the school fights, it's not prevalent on the platforms we're using. So we need help, right? TikTok is, mm -hmm. is a challenge and, and it's, you know, the social media evolves to where it's more cryptic. And it's mm -hmm. more difficult for us to kind of embed ourselves in that little community mm -hmm. and monitor it. So, you know, we're open to suggestions and, you know, yeah. help we can get. Yeah, I think it's, I think that we need to send a, a strong message to our parents and, and our community that if you know that this is happening to and report. to, sp yeah, to speak to your children as well and have them also report back and let's all work together. And, and as, as far as the school resource officer, she's from the county, you know, a few years back we uh, switched out ours mm -hmm. for theirs. Um, we've got a great working relationship with her. She's, she's amazing. She's got the trust of a lot of the kids there. And when things like this happen, a lot of times she knows about it and she'll let us know right away. 
and it will saturate that area mm -hmm. before it even happens, and it usually yeah. it doesn't happen. Uh, but she's got a good rapport with them, and we, like I said, we got a great relationship with her. I, an idea that I just have in what about if we make some kind of award for the kids to write an essay about challenge, how sad and stupid it's just to follow a challenge. And that way they can start the conversation, like some kind of award, some kind of reward for them to present us. Like let's think about some rules about it, make it cool, and for them maybe they want to participate and have that conversation. And that really just following a challenge is not worth it. You don't get out of nothing out of it. And being popular in internet is just, it's just, you know. Exactly, yeah. like yeah. something yeah. nice. So the, you know, uh, with the school, paneling with the school, yes. Account. Yeah, it'd be something nice. You know? And for and also what the vice mayor had rec suggested, the teen advisory. You know, this is something that they can also, yeah, take on you know, also. take on that accountability and try to resolve it within their community as well. Yeah, as we get back into the normal, there's a lot of. But you know what? We gotta get the parents. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, what I've noticed is, the, the, especially the middle schoolers, they're basically, and I had a conversation with our principal about that last week, they get out of school at 3 and they're just on the streets. They're literally wandering the streets. Even when I went into the park today, the kids are just in the park or they're literally want, wandering the streets. And there's no activities for them. They're just, yeah. you know, it's just an yeah, opportunity yeah, for so mischief. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing I was yeah, saying, exactly. The, no. Because they don't have a, a, a recess, they need to socialize somehow. So they, they get in trouble if they're talking inside the classroom. So they are outside and they're wondering and they go to Starbucks and McDonald's or whatever, because they really want to hang out. And, and they don't have that, yeah. that, that, that option. So we have to help them have also a, a safe space for them to, yeah. mm -hmm. because I don't think they have it. And I have two teenagers, three teenagers at home, one mm -hmm. almost going to college, and two middle schoolers here. So, And yeah. I want them to have a place where they can feel safe, where they can play, where they can do the things that we all did when we had that age, but mm -hmm. they don't have it now. No. I think the uh, I think the consensus is already clear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. You. Thank you. Um, okay, I don't I don't I don't know how many people have stuck around. Maybe, stuck around. Um, so sorry, we had a public speaker that wanted to speak on 12F. 12. We have what Pavel? Yes. We have Jerry Pavel. Oh, you want to speak on this too? Well, you've been very patient, so go ahead. Pavel Stoy, one seven one. Five North Bay Road. First of all, thank you very much for finally discussing these items that are pertaining to safety. I understand with the previous administration this was not a discussion that would have been had. Again, thank you for bringing this up, uh, Commissioner Binovich. And on this specific issue of, uh, of uh, violence amongst our kids, I understand there could be a multitude of uh, causes why it's happening. But we must do what we can do to, to prevent it, to stop the bullying and uh, as the saying goes, it takes a village to raise a child. We're not a village, we're a city, but we're such a tightly, tightly knit community. There are things that we can do. And I really much like the idea of this police explorers because uh, maybe we take the, the kids who are known mm -hmm. in, in engaging this kind of behavior and we put them together with our uh, members of the police force, actual members, and then they can show them proactively what it takes to, to maintain the, the law and the safety in, in the city. If we don't do anything, we, we fail the victim, but we also fail the, uh, the people who instigate this because we must uh, foster uh, an educational environment so the kids go to school and they feel safe. And it, it, this issue has been swept under the rug for far too long. Mm -hmm. I understand the school's position is, it didn't happen on the school property, we're not dealing mm -hmm. with it. But it probably started in the school environment this uh, friction or conversations or arguments, and then it permeates into, into the city streets. So I, I thank you very much for bringing this issue up, and I, I hope we can find a solution. And I very much like the police explorers idea. Thank you. Um, yeah. 
Thank you. Thank I want you. to add something, the, 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 the Police Athletic League, that's something right. else Which is for related, it's, it's a related yeah. thing that I think, yeah, yeah well, that we Which would we visit. Should, we should be, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know where we are on that pro on that process or We'll COVID revisit it. I was, I was thinking that. about it as this mm -hmm. discussion is, yeah. is but I, I think it's, we, we will come back and revisit yeah. it. And, and again, in connection with, with that conversation of, of a possible teen space that maybe that would, that's a place that could house it. Right, depending on the activities, or you know, it's a place to start. But yeah, yeah, and, and creating the and creating those relationships again, strength strengthening the the relationship between the community and the police yeah. department and the individual officers. It's all part of that, you know, that that bridge building that mm -hmm. that we need to do. Um, but but yeah, I think I think definitely our, we all agree that the teenagers. Um, well, they're a fickle group anyway. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're, they're, you know, if you, you can give them whatever, they'll be you like, know, oh, that's say. not cool now. <laughs> I wanted that last month. But uh, all we can do is try. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah. I very much appreciate so. you trying as a, as a father of two school-aged children who are growing up. I, I think we, we can and we must do. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for hanging in there. We have. Are we on uh, item thirteen yet? Yes, ma'am. No, we're not. I, I hope we. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, oh. my. I have my add-on. Oh, your add-on. Oh, that's right. So in uh, in 2018, the city entered into a land donation and transfer of development development rights agreement with uh, with Navarro, uh, where the the city purchased uh, or is in the process of purchasing the uh, Navarro pharmacy and and liquor store, uh, the total amount of purchase price for that transaction was $15.8 million. Claudia has told me that we've made payments uh, over the years, uh, so now it's down to approximately $12.7 million. In accordance with that contract, we're supposed to have a closing scheduled on or before December 31st. Uh, there's just no way that we can get there at this point in time. So all I'm asking is for your authority to allow me to extend the closing for another 30 days so that we can get the documentation needed and also an opportunity to speak with finance and the city manager to come up with a plan for either purchasing the, the, uh, the property outright now by paying off the $12.7 million dollars or keeping the existing agreement, which makes us gives us an opportunity to make five equal payments starting this uh, January 1 of 2023. So it's not this coming January, but we we don't want you, we don't want you to make that decision tonight. It's on, it, we'll bring it back in January with a full explanation of what our recommendation is from a financial and business standpoint. But we just need I need your authority to extend the closing for another 30 days. I've already been talking to Navarro's attorneys about that. They're amenable to doing it, but I didn't think I had the authority to do that on my own. Does it, does it have to be limited to 30 days? Do, would you need more time? Or is that a standard request? I, 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 don't, I don't think it's gonna take more than that. I mean, we've already started the, the document preparation stuff. Right now, it's more a question of what's in the best interest of the city, whether to come up with the $12 million now or to continue with the payments that are set forth in that agreement. And we'll have that for you by next meeting, and it's still within the 30 days. So, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, so we'll true. be there. Okay. I, I would just mention that we, maybe it's not for this discussion, but if we pay outright, then we'll collect the rent. We'll become the landlords right that's right you, yeah uh if we if we don't pay it off right now uh we'll have those five payments i said starting in 2023 but navarro continues to collect and keep the rent that's being paid by cvs uh for the for the lease that's on the property if we buy it out we become the landlord we accept the lease payments um you know which are approximately two hundred thousand dollars a year so so we want to, but we want to have the opportunity to look through and make sure the city has the finances available, and we'll work with um, with the city I mean, manager. You need the extension finance. regardless, I mean, there's, because there's no way. Right. I mean, you can't. Right. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so, I'll, so. It, right now it's just go ahead and extend it for 30 days and I'm good to go. I'm, I'm absolutely in favor of that okay. extension. Thank you. And then we'll evaluate the, the payment terms. Right. No, just the direction. Just the direction. Yeah. Okay. I don't need a motion. Just the consensus is all I really need. Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right. Item 13. Uh, we have a, we're on 13, right? Yes, <laughs> To the bitter end. <laughs> Okay, Vladimir Silverstone. Is there a Vladimir, Vladimir Silverstone in the audience? I guess. Okay. Felix Kisner. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Honorable Commission. My name is Felix Kisner, 250 174th Street. Um, I want to bring something up. There's a lot of word about safety. Safety is the, the word of the night that's been used over and over. Uh, there's another safety that we have to be concerned with. And I don't know how much you guys are prepared or how much from legal point of view uh, we can do much about it. But to give you an example, we have a zoonotic disease, which is SARS-CoV-2. We all thought it would be gone. We all thought that that's it, you know, science is going to defeated, but obviously it's here, and we have Omicron. We've seen Florida. Florida, by the way, South Florida is in pretty good shape. We're one of the highest vaccination areas in Florida, and in Sunny Isles Beach, I believe a lot of people are vaccinated thanks to your center right here, which makes it very, uh, very effective and very convenient, as well as um, this, new, this new variant only with a booster shot is it proving to be effective. But it's still, the vaccines are still protecting us. But I want to bring an example of something where sometimes you have to follow the science. For example, when we had the lockdown here, when everything was locked down, one of the biggest mistakes was made by the previous commission is shutting down the parks and the beaches. If they would listen to science that you can be outside fairly safely instead of getting people inside, and getting them more infected, opening up the parks, not having these alternate parks where they basically batched up a lot of kids together and a lot of parents instead of opening up, we have a lot of parks to have open. So you have to be prepared. We may experience a big spike. Why Omicron is dangerous, even though if you're vaccinated here, you know, there's 75% chance that you will not be severely ill, but you can get still sick. Three, four days, you can be knocked out in bed. And a lot of healthcare workers, we may be short on healthcare workers starting next year. So from the city point of view and commission point of view, I just want to recommend to you that you have some sort of a plan prepared that if this thing's going to hit us hard, what is our plan? Are we going to keep the parks open? Are we going to keep the beaches open? What are we going to do if there's, if there's a shortage of staff, for example, in the city? People can get sick. We don't know where this Omicron's going yet. There's some positive news that it's not as severe, but yet it, you can have police force apps at certain times. So just be prepared, have something out there. I don't know how much legal, again, we get a lot of things from CDC. I know the city gets the guidance from our state, from our governor, we get the guidance. But then the city, I believe, uh, and the legal point says what we can do to protect our residents and be ready if this thing hits us hard. My name is Felix, and by the way, I'm on several commissions in Clubhouse, social media. I used to be pharmaceutical executive. I used to be director of pharmaceutical division international for Bristol Myers Squibb, American company also work for an Italian company, but bottom line is I'm very interested in this topic and I want us to be safe and be ready if Omicron hits us hard. I'm done speaking. If you have any questions, I'll address them about this new area. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We, we've been actually talking about that, haven't we? <laughs> we've been discussing that. There's definitely a, a concern about an uptick in the, um, so thankfully we have the, we have our vaccination center. And mm -hmm. Right now, there's a shortage on the Regeneron. Um, Miami Not Dade, right? Miami Dade County is now there's a, a wait list of like three days to be able to go, and and obviously you need to get it as soon as possible. So the health department is um, a little bit concerned that if the spike continues to increase, um, we just won't have Regeneron available. Yeah. Uh, Stay safe. Yeah, I, I like to comment something. Obviously, we we go by what the uh, state is doing in the county, and um, 
during the first outbreak and the lockdowns and everything, obviously the beach and the parks, we're following uh, county uh, orders. So it, it was not the, the city that was uh, closing down the beaches or the parks. So we're just following that. But regardless of that, you know, I'm, I uh, represent the city with the Miami-Dade League of Cities. Um, the the, the Miami-Dade League of Cities, which is in close contact with, obviously, with Daniela Levin Cava's office and and uh, Jackson Memorial and everything, they're keeping a, a close eye on, on what's going on and, and, and hopefully it will not get to that point. Um, like you said, some of the data from the Omicron hopefully is less severe. They're saying it's more contagious, but it's less severe. So hopefully the impact would not be as negative, let's say. Yeah. But I, I, I will let you know whatever comes out of the county and, and, yeah. and all of that, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ari Steiger. Ari Steiger, 262 Atlantic Island. Now that we hear that we have the best police uh, in, in, the, in the state of Florida from the city manager, and we all know <coughs> it, this police is not running by himself. There's somebody leading this police in the city. What's going on with the contract for the chief? Is this going to prolong more and more time? Can we make an end to it? If you don't want him as chief, just let him go. But I think we should do an end to it because it's already, what, six, seven months, and there's no end to it. So please, make a decision and Keep Mike as the chief of police of Sunny Isles for the better. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jody Joseph, you have two speaker cards for the for this. Jody Joseph, one eighty five sixty North Bay Road. Um, I just I don't know if you can answer it or not. But it's um, it is regarding our police chief, and I'm I know that we hired a headhunter, which I was 100% against, and a lot of people were against that. I think the fee was approximately seventy thousand dollars, and I know we had discussed there's very few officers here right now, but we have amazing men and women on our force, and I think the fact that we hired a headhunter to find other people, it was just. For some reason or other, um, Sunny Isles has no problem spending taxpayer money, and I don't think that was necessary. We have amazing men and women, um, and when we hired the headhunter, there was a list of 70 individuals who were qualified. And um, interesting enough, the 70 individuals came down to, I think there was five on the list, is that correct? Am I saying that, is there five now? Five on the list, okay. And it's interesting because um, we spoke to the headhunter and people in our neighborhood, you know, gave some names. Um, you're like, Brandon, Brandon Eddie, Captain Brandon Eddie, nothing against you personally. It's just we're trying to be fair and honest. And this list should not be based on race, gender, or religion. And the fact is that we know um, one person in particular, Lieutenant John Weish, um, who's always in our neighborhood. Our, our people in Golden Shores are very, very familiar with him and called, <clears throat> pardon me, and when we called the headhunter, he was very impressed. He said, wait, are you telling me that he was actually um, schooled in Quantico? That's FBI. I said, yes, he is, without a doubt. And I know that um, uh, Captain Chief um, Snyder was as well, but not many people have the Quantico training, and he does. And uh, somehow we just, um, I had called him, and he said, oh yeah, he's no longer on the list. And I said, well, how do you go from 70 people, when we spoke, you said that he's going to be on the top of the list because of his qualifications. Qualifications. Besides that, he's also been with Sunny Isles, I think, over 20-something years. Y you've all been uh, with Sunny Isles at the same time, correct? Like over 20 years? Right. So just to keep things fair, a lot of things happen that there isn't a fair explanation. And I think people are owed answers, quite frankly. And um, 
I, we called him last week, and he said, oh, I'll definitely get back to you in the beginning of this week. So I assumed, he, I, you know, we'd hear from him on Monday. It's going fast. Didn't hear from him Tuesday, waited, um, called Wednesday, and he said, oh, I'll definitely look into it. I said, you need to have his name, just in all fairness, back on the list. Called him all day, he won't return a phone call. Now, he said he took his name off the list for no reason. How does somebody do that that we paid $70,000 to, if I could just continue this? Um, so I'm thinking, did he really take his name off the list, or did, was he ordered to have his name taken off the list? This is somebody we paid a lot of money to, and he said himself that he's one of the most qualified people. And again, we were hoping to have somebody from our force, Sunny Isles Beach, who I think we have the best force anywhere, period. I mean, there's wonderful policemen everywhere, but we're so grateful for SIB, men and women. And I still need to understand why he's not on that list. I'm not saying he should get the job, but I think he should have every opportunity that everyone else that qualifies has that opportunity. So we need to know why he was taken off the list. And um, again, his qualifications are far superior to a lot of people that are on the list. So I'd like an answer to that, if you don't mind. I don't know if anyone is aware that he was on the list and he had Quantico training. He was one of the few that had Quantico training. And again, he's been with us for over 20 years. So, you know, if we could look into that and get him back on the list and just be interviewed. He wasn't even interviewed. This is the shameful part. They just decided to knock him off the list. So this sounds more political to me because it is definitely not his qualifications. So if we could look into that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, you filled out two speaker cards, so I guess there are a, another topic that you want to talk about? Yeah, just I guess it kind of goes back to what I was just saying. Um, <coughs> everyone knows that um, there was a program, an autism program, that I suggested that we have. I don't know if, if anybody recalls the program that I was speaking about. You do. And it was before any program that anyone else suggested here. And sadly, it is kind of relevant to what I was just talking about with um, Lieutenant Weish and how people get on lists and off lists um, and their qualifications don't matter when they should. This was an excellent, excellent course. Um, this woman has been doing this and she's HOPSI approved. Anyone that knows HOPSI or is involved with um, autism know, knows her. She doesn't charge. She all over Florida does EMT, police, fire rescue, and it's a phenomenal program. Her son goes with her, he's nonverbal. And in the time of um, COVID, it's very important. I mean, you watch the news and we were all speaking about it ourselves. People were depressed, people were doing drugs, people were running up and down the street, people that never had a problem who could have been shot. And sadly, because it was just Jerry and myself who thought of this, um, this program was tossed under the rug because it was more important to have the mayor and commissioner get the credit. And I just think that's absolutely wrong because you're there to look out for the residents and the taxpayers, not what's best for a mayor and commissioners. And that's what, ha what happened 100%. And also, we're supposed to be looking out for our men and women because had they taken that course, I think it could have been a raise for everybody and it would have improved their resume as well. And um, this would have been back in April, and her course is superior, period. There's other courses which are wonderful too, but they don't have um, a person with autism, and they charge you. But it's interesting to get this course in, to bump ours out, the, co the course that was brought in, they always charge. They did it for free, and they brought somebody in, which they never did. They always just showed videos. So they knew they had to compete with um, Ms. Becerra's course and her son, again, who's nonverbal. He's been doing this. They travel all over for years. So I'm just trying to understand why our commissioner and mayors are not looking out for our residents and our police and rather more concerned with who's getting the kudos for something, when I couldn't care less about that. Jerry and I could not care less. It was just a phenomenal program that I think everyone should have had. And you know what? The second program that went through the card would have been great. It would have been, a, it would have been the second program. So, I mean, we've got to think about these things, and I would like an answer as to why that even happened. I, I, I don't know what happened, but I do think that it's a great suggestion Mm -hmm. um, I'm a former exceptional student education teacher. We should have had that back in April. Right. They all, and I was talking to actually um, Chief Snyder who knew about it. Mm -hmm. And it got hushed hushed and then I spoke to 
did we not speak about it? Yeah, I would love to see, to, especially to, yeah, if it's for if it's yeah, being but I done spoke to complimentary. Chief Eddie about it as well, and um, nobody did anything because somebody here had the power to pull it because they wanted their program put through. And I'm sorry, but that's just honest from my heart. And I don't think that's the way. That's the timing. We, we have to trust our mayor and commissioners to do what's right for the people mm -hmm. and our police. So please, let's Thanks. look out for the residents from here on in. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. If I could just clarify that. <clears throat> Chief Snyder, whatever happened with him with the, the classes she represented, I don't know. But I could tell you, I was given the name of this CARD program, which is the University of Miami and Nova Southeastern both reputable colleges. Um, when I started looking into it, I found out Sylvia Flores was also looking into it with her people, already had it scheduled. Uh, Vice Mayor Vizcarra did give me the name of this mm. company. We called them. No, the commission, I can tell you, had no influence over who I picked. It was the only one I knew at the time. I did get this folder eventually from Lieutenant Weiss, but at that point, Sylvia was already committed to using this company for her people and it didn't make sense to bring two different separate or two separate companies in. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we went with the same company. It had nothing but rave, rave reviews from all of our officers. They, the instructor that also has a child that's autistic. So I mean, I think they're all working to the same for the same purpose. It wasn't a matter of competition. Who's going to teach who? They were both free classes. I mean, they it, they did a great job. I would have no problem using them again, or I wouldn't have a problem looking at her company, but. It definitely wasn't influenced by any commissioners or anybody else. And uh, the, uh, the card program, the card program had actually done work with our department before, because um, I, I recall when I was on the CAC, I had recommended it to, to Chief Moss, and he he just took it and ran. And he, I know he had provided some some training to the to the police department pre previously. So there is an existing relationship there with the yeah. department. And the card program, as far as I know, has, has never charged. Their, their services have always been free. Uh, and I, I saw the, uh, the, the, um, the postings online. I mean, it, it seemed like it was very well attended. You invited other departments. And we had several of um, them attend. I mean, I, it looked like it was a good program. Yeah, and it was, it, like yeah. I said, it wasn't a competition of one or yeah. the other. Mm -hmm. They were both reputable. They were both good. Matter of fact, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, a year or so ago, they mandated um, some mm -hmm. autism training to all officers now as mm -hmm. part of their certification. And when they built the criteria, they opened it up to several of these instructors and Bart Barta, the one that did ours, as well as the one Ms. Um, Joseph was just representing, they were both part of that board that picked what the criteria was gonna be. So they're obviously both reputable, but like, I just wanted to clarify there was no influence anywhere. I picked it and, and there was no discussion about it. I'm, I'm glad that, that they got the training. Yeah, so they did. Like I said, a lot of the departments from all over Dade County came to this. It, it was great. They did reviews at the end, and they got nothing but rave reviews. Great. So it was very, very informative. Absolutely. But I was just saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mayor, I mean, the discussion is done, yeah. so we can move on to the can next we, item. Is that it? We're, we're, that's we're, all that's we it. have. Motion to adjourn. Short meeting. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be out of here in no time. <laughs> famous, they call that where I come from, famous last words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you. Yes.